Hey hi, welcome to the Cisco SD1 course where we will cover the fundamentals of Cisco SD1 along with demos. First of all, let me introduce myself. I am Vignesh Pandurangan and I have about 11 years of experience in network industry and specifically about Cisco SD1. I have been working on this technology for about 5 years now. The prerequisites for this course will be good understanding on RNS, how IPsec based channels work and a bit of idea about WAN networks. Apart from that, I don't see any other major things which you may need to know before jumping into this course. At the end of this course, you should be definitely in a position to build your own Cisco SD1 setup with all the core functionalities. I have also shared the link for the lab topology diagram in the description box. This is the exact lab topology which we will be using in this video. If possible, please download and print this diagram so you can reference them while going through this course. Finally, if you are looking to gain knowledge for designing, implementing or providing operational support to Cisco SD1 enabled network, you are in the right place. Let's get started. What are current challenges in WAN? Why do we need SD1 and what are some of the differentiators of Cisco SD1 from other vendors? In current WAN network, there are some challenges which we face. Some of them are insufficient bandwidth. There might be cases where you may have dual MPLS or internet connectivities to a site, but we cannot natively do active-active load sharing to utilize both the circuits. Limited application awareness. We will have very less visibility into the applications that are being used in the WAN network. Applications downtime. Think of a scenario when you have a site with dual links and all the traffic is primarily sent via the first link. When there is heavy packet drops or loss in the first link, our critical applications may still try to use this first link by which the application may suffer. Fragmented security. To enable end-to-end -end security in traditional WAN network, it is a tough job and a complete manual effort which will be huge. No cloud apps readiness. Integrating with the cloud-based SaaS or IAS providers is not natively built in. Some examples of SaaS will be O365, SharePoint and examples of IAS will be logical space which we will get in AWS, Azure or GCP. Some other challenges are limited scale, high cost and complex operations and management. Software defined WAN is nothing but a way in which we will be able to centrally provision the network and also to manage, monitor, report or even troubleshoot the network. Lots of the manual efforts which we will make in managing the traditional WAN networks are automated in SD WAN solutions. Some of the advantages we may get with the software defined WAN solutions are the operational cost will be low. Application performance and network quality of experience will be increased. You will understand this when we look at policies, application aware routing in the future sections of this video. Also, security and data privacy can be provided natively as a part of the solution, which will save huge effort in terms of configuring and managing the same. Some of the differentiators of Cisco SD1 solution Viptala are Cloud or on-prem delivered SDN architecture, both options are available for the customers to use. The controllers can be brought up in the cloud where we will have variety of options. Also, if in case the requirement is to build the same on-prem for any reason, the same is possible as well. Application quality of experience will be high for any on-prem or cloud hosted applications as we discussed in the last slide. Say for example, we have options to track the performance of O365 application via all of our available paths and take decision to send the traffic via the best performing one. There is many more options which will enhance the application experience in Cisco SD1. Comprehensive security. Security is the heart of this solution. Anything and everything in Cisco SD1 solution is secured. For example, what are the hardware devices which are allowed to get onboarded in the network is restricted. Also, the control and data plane traffic is completely secured as well. Flexible operations. The management of the network is very simple since most of the stuffs are automated and also controlled from a centralized controller.
Let us discuss about the different types of components which are available in Cisco ST1 solution. Also, we will discuss on each of their roles in the network. The first one is VBond, which will be the orchestrator plane. V Manage and V Analytics are the management plane components. V Smart is the control plane component, and data plane will be the managed routers. Let's start by looking at the VBond in detail. You can think about VBound as the gatekeeper. Every device in the Cisco SD1 solution, including the vManage, vSmart, and WAN routers, must first authenticate themselves successfully with the VBound, and then only they will be able to speak with any other components in the network. Distributes list of vSmarts vManage to all vManage routers. When a router in any site comes up, it first reaches out to the vBound, and vBound is the one who will inform edge router about the other controllers in the network, say vManage or vSmart. Facilitates NAT traversal. The vBond does act as a stun server, session traversal utilities for NAT, meaning in case if you have a branch where the ISP have provided you a modem and the SD1 router is connected behind the modem, in this case, the SD1 router will mostly get a private IP address assigned by the modem and when the traffic exits the modem, it will NAT it to a public IP. In this case, the VBond will be able to identify both private and public IP address natively. Requires public IP address could sit behind one to one NAT. When we bring up a VBond, wherever it may be, in a cloud or on-prem, if the VBond is sitting behind a NAT, it should be a one to one NAT. Also, we have to make sure that every device in the network should be able to reach the VBond IP address at any case. Highly resilient. We can have multiple VBonds in a network for redundancy. Mostly it will be one in a DC and one in a DR. Next one is the vManage, single pane of glass for day zero, day one and day two operations. vManage is basically your one step graphical user interface for everything. New device bring up changes to an existing network, monitoring the performance of the network, reporting, etc. Multi-tenant with web scale. A vManage can be either single tenant or multi tenant, both options are available. Centralized provisioning, meaning any new device bring up is done with the support of vManage. Policies and templates, network wide policies or a device specific policy, everything will be created from vManage only. Followed by troubleshooting and monitoring, which can also be done from the vManage. Software upgrades, GUI with RBAC. Role-based access control is available for the vManage, meaning uh, we can customize which user gets access to which sections of the vManage. Programmatic interfaces, REST, NetConf. The next big thing with the vManage is APIs. We can query the vManage with API call so that it returns data. This data can be further used to prepare our own custom dashboards or also we can do configuration changes to the vManage with this APIs as well. Highly resilient. We can have multiple vManage devices built in a cluster for redundancy purposes. One another component in the Cisco SD1 solution is vAnalytics. The first thing to note about vAnalytics is that it is only available as a SaaS, just like your Office 365. The vAnalytics in general is the component which is going to provide you rich analytics about your network, starting from link utilization up to granular application level reports. On a high level, the vManage actually collects the data from all the SD1 routers and then share the raw data with the vAnalytics. vAnalytics will process this data to provide us great reports. Next, let's look at the control plane component of Cisco SD1 solution, which is the vSmart. Facilitates fabric discovery. vSmart is the device which shares control plane information between the routers in all the site. The SD1 routers doesn't share routing information directly. vSmart is very similar to a BGP route reflector but with advanced functionalities. Dissimulates control plane information between managers, meaning shares the routing information between the SD1 routers in different sites as I informed. Distributes data plane and app hour routing policies to the managed routers. vSmart is responsible for key exchange as well. As you are aware, the primary functionality of an SD1 is security. Data traffic is completely encrypted between the sites. For this encryption to happen, we need key exchange, right? How do we do this in our regular IPsec tunnel? 
we create phase one to securely exchange this key, isn't it? But here, since we have the vSmart already available, and also Vanage and vSmart have a secure control plane connection already built between them, the key exchange between the sites will happen through this tunnel with the help of vSmart. vSmart also helps in pushing the application aware routing policies to the required sites. This we will look in detail in later sections. Implements control plane policies such as service chaining, multi topology, and multi hop. In Cisco SD1, we do service chaining and a lot of other things. In all those cases, vSmart will be the one implementing those changes in the network. Dramatically reduces control plane complexity. Since you understand all the SD1 router doesn't exchange routing or other information directly between them, rather they always communicate via the vSmart, right? There is no need for direct peerings between the sites. Obviously, this reduces major complication in the control plane. Highly resilient. Yes, we can have multiple vSmarts for redundancy purposes. Let me stop here. So far, we have learned about vBond, vManage, vSmart and vAnalytics. These are the controllers. Maybe they are sitting in the customer data center itself or in Cisco's data center or in AWS, Azure Cloud or anywhere, right? This components is going to take place only in the control plane of the solution, not in the data plane at all. Remember this, okay? The final device which we are going to discuss is about the SD-WAN edge routers. Throughout this series, you will hear me calling these in common as the WAN edge routers. Hope you know Viptela was a separate organization before Cisco have acquired it. After Cisco acquiring Viptela, there have been huge enhancements to the solution. One of it is making all the existing Cisco routers to support or join the Viptela sd solution. Viptela had their own hardware before, which we will term as VHS, and Cisco routers which can support sd is called CHS. So if you hear me saying VH, it means Viptela hardware, and if I say CH, it is a Cisco hardware. Provides a secure data plane with remote managed routers. The primary role of this managed routers is in the data plane. They forward the data packets securely between the sites. The routing and IPsec key details are shared by the controllers to these managed routers, as we already discussed in the previous slides. Establishes a secure control plane with vSmart controllers, OMP. As discussed earlier, there will be secure control plane connections built from the vantage routers to the vSmart. Via this tunnel, the routing, policies and other IPsec details are also shared securely. The protocol which is going to support to exchange all these details between the vSmart and vantage routers is the OMP, Overlay Management Protocol. We will look at this OMP in an upcoming section. Implements data plane and application aware routing policies. When there is a need that you want to do application based routing and you create a policy, obviously you will create the policy in the vManage via GUI, but it will be pushed all the way up to the vManage routers. So they will send the data traffic according to the policy. Now, where this vManage router will connect to on the LAN side? obviously to any core switch in the site, right? So it does support traditional routing protocols as well. Not only in the LAN side, we can definitely configure these protocols on the WAN side as well. Support zero touch deployment. It is nothing but say for instance, you buy a new router and send it directly to your branch office. You can call your local admin there to connect the router to a internet link with DHCP DNS enabled, you're good to go. The router have the capability to automatically find a way to reach the vbond vmanage and vsmart devices and join the sd1 overlay this is called as ztp zero touch provisioning physical or virtual form factor we have hardware routers and also virtual routers the virtual routers are mostly brought up in the cloud data centers like aws azure gcp etc Note, in our course, we will be using only this virtual routers in our lab to demonstrate. We will be discussing this in detail in the later stages when we get into the demo sections. Okay, just a quick recap. The components that make up the Cisco sd solution are vBond, vSmart, vManage and Vanage routers. It can be either VH or CH. 
V analytics is an optional component only available as a SaaS solution. Whether you deploy the controllers V manage, V smart or V bond in an on-prem DC or anywhere in a cloud, they are only available as a virtual component. So basically you will bring up these as a virtual machines on top of an hypervisor. There is both support for ESXi and KVM hypervisors. As we discussed already, the WAN edge routers can be both physical and virtual. Also note that there is as many as variety of Cisco hardware out there which can support SD-WAN functionality. Say for instance, ISR 4Ks, 1Ks, ASRs, etc. Now let's look into the major and important terminologies which you need to get familiar with. Don't worry, even if you are not able to understand them clearly here, you will obviously get hold of them as the course progresses since we will use this term repeatedly. The grey box you see here represents an bandage router. On a high level, we can say that the bandage router is segregated into three separate VPNs. In Cisco SD-WAN, VPN is nothing but VRFs in your traditional routers. So we have a transport VPN, the red one in my slide, and if you see, it also have an ID which is VPN 0. The transport VPN is where we terminate all our WAN links, whether it is MPLS or internet, they all will get terminated on this VPN if they are going to act as an SD-WAN transport. Also note, VPN 0 number is dedicated to transport VPN. So if you hear me saying transport VPN or VPN 0, I'm talking about the VPN where the WAN links are getting terminated. Okay. Also note that we always have only one transport VPN. The next is the service VPN, green one in my slide. This is where the LAN links connect. Say for example, your core switch in the site may terminate on this VPN. We can have multiple service VPNs. Think in your office if you have user machines and voice traffic. We can create one service VPN for the user data and one more service VPN for the voice traffic. Then we will just assign them each with a different VPN number. The service VPN numbering can range between 1 to 511. I want to highlight one more thing here. Since the range of service VPN numbers can be between 1 to 511, it doesn't mean that we can create 511 service VPNs in a router. The routers, depending on the hardware and licenses, can support only a limited number of service VPNs but you are free to assign them with any numbers between 1 to 511. Out of band management VPN or the OOB VPN, the yellow box in our diagram, it is in short nothing but an out of band connectivity to the box itself. This VPN really doesn't have any other functionalities. The number for this VPN is 512. Let's start with the most common terminologies of Cisco SD-WAN which you need to grip to follow me throughout this course easily. First one is the transport side. This we have discussed in the previous slide. This is the place where the WAN links connect. Also, we will call these connectivities as the underlay connectivity or underlay network. Because only on top of this path, the SD-1 routers will form the overlay tunneled network. This transport VPN is always the VPN 0. And this is where the traffic gets encrypted and tunneled to the other sites. Also, there is options where we can say not to tunnel some specific traffic, rather send them natively on the WAN link. This is called as DIA, Direct Internet Access in Cisco sd wan terms. We have separate section talking about DIA as well, where we can definitely check this out in our lab. Service VPN. This is the one connecting to the LAN side. The VPN numbering can range between 1 to 511 and 512 is reserved for OOB, just like the way in which VPN 0 is reserved for transport right here in the service vpn we will see the actual original traffic from or to the lan this is one important term that i want you to understand t lock you can think of this as a identity card given to an wan interface go back to your school days for a moment and think what details your school identity card will have your name which standard and maybe a section and also the school name right all these details makes up your identity card and in turn that card gives you a unique identity right same way t-lock is a collection of system ip color 
and private and public IP addresses. With this TLOG details, we will be able to uniquely identify an WAN interface in the complete network. By the way, you might ask me what is a system IP or color in the first place. Just hold on for a minute, we are going to talk about them separately. The VRoute. It is nothing but the routes available in the service side VPN. As we discussed already, VPNs is nothing but VRFs, right? So every VPN will maintain their own separate routing table. This VRoute is also called as service routes. You will definitely hear me using the term service routes more often. OMP. This is an important one in Cisco SD1. OMP is the routing protocol which runs only between the VH routers and vSmart devices. Using this OMP protocol only, the vSmart exchanges the routing updates between the sites. Not only that, policy details, IPsec keys, etc. are also shared using this protocol only. Next is the site ID. It is just an identification given per site. If there is two routers in a site, both will be assigned with the same site ID. By which the Cisco SD-WAN can understand that both routers belong to the same site and there will be no IPsec tunnels formed between them. Not only that, site ID is used when writing policies as well. It is one of the mandatory configurations. System IP is nothing but an router ID for the Cisco SD-WAN component. Every device starting from vManage, vSmart, vBond and the Vanage routers, everyone have a unique system IP assigned to them. If you are familiar with the router ID concept in OSP of BGP or any other routing protocols, this is the equivalent here in Cisco SD1. It is a 32-bit dotted decimal value looking like an IP address. We have talked about OMP protocol in the last slides, right? Say for example, when an OMP neighborship is formed between a Vanage router and a vSmart, it is formed between these system IP addresses. Organization name. Organization name is something which is uh, assigned to every component in the Cisco SD-1 network and it should be exactly the same throughout the Cisco SD-1 overlay. It is definitely case sensitive. This value will come into picture when SD-1 components authenticate between them for control connection formation. There is also one more thing which I haven't mentioned in the slide that is the SP organization name which is the service provider organization name. This term will come into picture when we are enabling a complete end-to-end multi-tenant Cisco SD-1 setup. What is a zero trust architecture in Cisco SD-1? Basically, no one is trusted in Cisco SD-1 until they authenticate successfully with a certificate, serial number or other parameters. Now, when we bring up the head end controllers, they authenticate between them using a signed certificate. And how do they get the signed certificate in first place? It is from a certificate authority. Also, they use serial numbers to authenticate between the controllers in certain scenarios. But predominantly, the certificate is the mechanism using which the authentication happens. In terms of the root certificate, it is already available in the operating system itself. And uh, if in case you are using an enterprise CA, you should upload the enterprise based root certificate to all the controllers manually. The concept of Cisco SD WAN is that any Vanage routers coming up in the network should be allowed specifically by the administrator to join the overlay. Only then they will form control plane connections with the controllers and then followed by that data traffic forwarding will happen. If a router serial number is not allowed, they will not be able to join the network at all. This serial number file is generated in the PNP portal and uploaded onto the vManage and then vManage will distribute this serial file to all other controllers in the network. The serial numbers can be kept in different state. First is valid. When it is listed as valid, the router will be allowed to form control connections with the controllers followed by they will start participating in the data forwarding. Invalid state means that the router is not allowed to join the SD1 network at all. The last state is staging. When a serial number is marked with staging option, then the router will be allowed to form only control connections, but it will not be able to form any data plane tunnels with the other routers. When the Vanage router wants to come up in a network, the first device it will try to form a control connection is with the VBOND. While trying to form control connections, Vanage router will submit its signed certificate and vBond will authenticate the same. Also, the authentication process will happen in other direction as well. 
where V bond will share its signed certificate to the Vanage router, which will be authenticated by the Vanage router. Along with this signed certificate authentication, the controllers will check the serial file list whether the Vanage router is allowed or not. The Vanage router will get its root CA from the operating system, whereas the signed certificate is built into the tamper proof hardware chip when shipped from the Cisco itself. If in case this is a virtual router, then there will be a slight difference where uh, the virtual router should reach out to the vManage in order to get a signed certificate. Also, if you are using your own enterprise based certificate authority, then you should manually upload the enterprise root certificate to the vManage routers. Let's look into how the overlay routing works in Cisco SD1 and also about the protocol which supports in route and other attribute exchange process. Overlay management protocol is the control plane that is uh, the routing protocol of the Cisco SD1 overlay. It does act as a route reflector to share routing informations between different SD1 sites and also along with routing information it does carry additional details such as uh, VPN, service chaining etc. Using the updates from the OMP, an SD1 edge router will be able to decide upon how and whom to send a particular packet to. It does share the security association parameters for establishing secure IPsec tunnel between the different SD1 branches. Overlay routing, application error routing and centralized data policy details etc. are also shared via OMP updates from vSmart. OMP peering is established between the system IP addresses of each SD1 edge routers and vSmarts. From every SD1 edge router, there will be only one OMP peering formed to a vSmart irrespective of the number of transports available. So in case there is three transports on the edge router and there is two vSmarts in the overlay, you should see two OMP peerings from the SD1 edge router to the vSmarts. Okay, let's look at this example on the screen. There is two vSmarts and one SD1 edge router. Also, there is two transports available, one MPLS and one internet. vSmart and band edge router both are connected to both the transport. In this scenario, between the vSmarts themselves, they do establish the OMP peering, so they can be completely synchronized between them. DTLS or TLS based control tunnel will be established from the SD1 edge router to the vSmart1 via both MPLS and internet circuits. After that, a OMP peering session will be brought up automatically between the VAN edge and the vSmart1. Same process will be followed between the SD1 edge router and the vSmart2 as well. Control tunnels will be formed via MPLS and internet transports from the SD1 edge router to the vSmart2 and a OMP peering is established between them as well. Via these OMP peerings, all details like routes, service and policy etc. will be shared. In general, there is three types of routes which the OMP carries. First one is T-lock routes. T-lock routes does carry the details about WAN interfaces. To be precise, the transport interfaces. Whether it is a MPLS or internet interface, they have certain attributes like WAN IP, port number on which they listen and also there will be IPsec parameters for them as well. To convey this in short, all the data about the WAN interfaces are shared via this TLOC route updates of the OMP. The most prominent attributes carried in a TLOC route update are site ID, NCAP detail, these are the IPsec parameters for the TLOC public IP, public port, private IP and private port. This is the port details on which the TLOC will listen or accept the connections on. BFD status, tag, preference, weight, etc. Preference is nothing but a regular preference to the TLOC. It is a value which will be shared to the other sites and based on which the other sites will take decision about which TLOC to prefer. Weight is a local attribute which helps the local router in deciding which TLOC is a preferred path. The next type of route is the OMP route, which is otherwise termed in general as VPN route, service route, and also sometimes as a LAN route. They are basically the LAN prefixes on the SD-WAN edge routers service VPN. 
These routes will be advertised from all service VPNs of every SD-WAN edge router to the vSmarts. The most prominent attributes carried in a service route update are TLOG, which is the WAN interface IP address details of the site where the specific LAN route is available. Based on this detail, this service route will need to do a recursive lookup into the TLOG route table as we discussed previously. And then there will be site ID, label, label helps in identifying which VPN the route belongs to. And then uh, VPN ID, tag, preference, originator system IP, origin protocol. This is the LAN protocol from where the route is redistributed. And finally, the origin metric. This is the metric which is carried from the LAN protocol. The final type of route is a network service route. To put it in simple way, say for example, uh, if you have a firewall IPS or IDS uh, in your data center and you want all your branch locations to use this service in the data center for specific traffic, then the first step we have to do in Cisco SD1 is that we have to add this firewall IPS or IDS to the data center SD1 router as a service using the service route option in Cisco SD1. When you create a service route, this service route get populated automatically throughout the overlay. Then after this, we need to create a data policy and direct traffic towards that specific service so that uh, all the required traffic matching in the data policy will flow via that service as we need it to be. In this case, the service route should be advertised into the overlay, isn't it? This is done by the OMP protocol in the form of network service route. We will explore service chaining in detail in our channel, but for now, I hope you are able to get a basic idea about this type of route. The most prominent attributes carried in a network service route are VPN ID, service ID, label, originator system IP and TLOC. Let's quickly discuss about timers and values in OMP. Number of advertised routes in vSmart and Vantage. So by default, only four next stops will be advertised by a vSmart or a Vantage about a specific subnet. We can change that anywhere from 1 to 16. Number of installed OMP paths in Vantages. Even though you receive any number of OMP next stop paths, we can decide how many paths will go into the routing table. Default 4 and it can be between 1 to 16 as well. OMP hold timer. This determines how long you should wait before declaring an OMP peering to be down. By default it is 60 seconds and it can be configured between 0 to 65535. And also as a thumb rule we should make sure that it is two times higher than the hello tolerance interval set on a WAN interface. OMP update advertisement interval. This is the speed in which OMP sends update packets. Default 1 second and it can be between 0 to 65535. End of rib. When an OMP session goes down and comes back up, after 5 minutes an end of rib marker will be set and sent. Once it receives an end of rib marker, any routes that were not refreshed after the OMP session came back right, they all will be considered as stale and they will be deleted from the routing table. By default it's 5 minutes and it's configurable as well. Now let's discuss about control and data plane in Cisco SD1 and also how segmentation is achieved between different VPNs. We will also see how control and data plane are secured in Cisco SD1. On a high level, Cisco SD1 does form DTLS or TLS based secure tunnels between the controllers and as well as from the Vantage router to the controllers. Whereas between the Vantage routers, they form IPsec tunnels. But the biggest difference about the data plane IPsec tunnels in Cisco SD1 is that we don't have a phase 1 at all. The key exchange will happen via the secured DTLS tunnel which we already have with the vSmart device. In terms of the control plane tunnel which is the DTLS connection, encryption is handled with AES-256 and integrity by SHA-1 or 2. Also the devices will exchange digital certificates as we discussed in previous sections which is a signed certificate between them for the authentication purposes. Now, what's next after DTLS or TLS based control plane tunnel is successfully established? Every communication including the OMP route or policy exchange or uh, any netcom sessions, whatever it is, right, will be communicated via this secure DTLS or TLS tunnels. 
In turn, this makes everything secured in Cisco SD1. If you remember, I have told you there is no phase one at all for data plane IPsec tunnels in Cisco SD1 routers. Then you might think how the key exchange between SD1 routers will be secured. Obviously, it will be the WAN edge router doesn't speak directly for anything related to control connectivity, right? So all the control plane communications and key exchanges will happen via the vSmart. And obviously, we already have a secured DTLS or TLS based tunnel between the WAN edge router and vSmart. So everything is already secured in control plane. So we don't need to maintain a separate phase one tunnel between the routers like we do in our traditional network. Let's quickly discuss about the control plane timers. First, hello interval. It is the key play in which hello packets are sent in a DTLS tunnel, right? By default, it is per second and it can be between 100 milliseconds to 60,000 or uh, 6 lakhs milliseconds, which is uh, 10 minutes, right? Hello tolerance. Hello tolerance is nothing but uh, how long should I wait before declaring a tunnel down? By default, it is 12 seconds and it can range between 12 through 6,000 seconds. Let's quickly look at the high level of data plane security in Cisco SD1. In our topology, we do have two Vantage routers and two transports and one vSmart, which is going to help in the control plane. First, a DTLS or TLS based control plane tunnel will be formed from each of the Vantage router towards the vSmart. And then within this tunnel, a OMP session will also be formed. Followed by that, OMP updates will be exchanged via this OMP peerings. Basically, it will carry the routing information, IPsec key parameters and other data. Once this data is exchanged between the sites, the WAN edge routers will go ahead and establish a direct data plane IPsec tunnel, which is a BFD tunnel. Let's quickly look at how data plane key exchange happens in Cisco SD1. If you look at the diagram, here we do have two T logs. And also on the other end, we do have two T logs, which is two transport interfaces, right? For each of the T logs, each router will generate a separate encryption key. So if you see on the left, there is encryption key one and two, which is generated by this router for both of his transport interfaces. The orange key on the right, which is encryption key three and key four are generated by that router for his own T logs. So how these keys are exchanged between the routers? Obviously, as we discussed already, it's via the vSmart. So now the edge routers would have received the other side's encryption key as well. Now, when the left side router wants to initiate a communication to the right side router, he knows about the encryption key of that router as well. So next step, they will go ahead and establish a BFD tunnel. You see here, from this router, he uses encryption key 3 when he is sending packets out of this transport towards the other side. Whereas in the other direction, he is using key 1, right? Same way, if we see the tunnel which is on the bottom, this router is using encryption key 2 when he is sending traffic to the other side via this tunnel. And from this router's perspective, he is using encryption key 4 when he is sending traffic from this router to the other router via this specific transport. This is how the key exchange happens in Cisco SD1. Let's quickly look at the data plane timers as well. First, hello interval. It is basically the hello packets sent on the BFD tunnel which we have. By default, it is one second and it can be between 100 to 6 lakh milliseconds. And then the multiplier. So multiplier is not in seconds, right? Say for example, um, by default, the hello interval is one second and the multiplier, if you see on the screen, is seven for hardware edge routers, right? That means it will declare the tunnel to be down after seven seconds. And if you change this hello interval to be two and keep the multiplier as seven, that means two into seven, which gives 14, he will declare the tunnel to be down after the 14th second. Okay, we have already discussed that we can create multiple service VPNs in a Cisco SD1 router, right? So if you see this diagram, we do have two service VPNs, VPN 1 and 2 on this router and as well as on this router, we do have VPN 1 and 2. Between these two routers, we will obviously have only one IPsec tunnel. 
then how do the other router will know which VPN the traffic belongs to? It is basically achieved with a label in Cisco SD WAN. So based on the label, the other end router will be decrypting the packet and assigning the traffic directly into the specific VPN. Say for example, if a VPN 1 is assigned VPN label uh, 101 in the overlay, when site 1 sends the traffic, it will tag label 101 and encrypt the data and send it over the transport. When the other site receives that, it's going to decrypt the packet and see the VPN label and it will decide that the traffic belongs to VPN 1. This is how we will achieve end-to-end -end segmentation in Cisco ST1. Let's now look at what is a certificate authority followed by the different ways in which Cisco SD1 controllers can get their signed certificate which they can use for authentication purposes. Let's see how a certificate authority works in general. As we know lots of services use a certificate based authentication like our Cisco SD1 solution. The left side box represents a applicant and the right one is a certificate authority. In our case the applicant will be vManage, vBond or vSmart controllers. An applicant will generate a key pair consisting of a private key and a public key along with a certificate signing request which is a CSR. A CSR is an encoded text file that includes the public key and other information that will be included in the certificate. Example domain name, organization name, email address etc. The applicant will have a private key as well but it is not going to be shared outside at any instance. After generating the CSR, the applicant sends it to a CA who verifies that the information it contains is correct or not. If all informations are correct, it digitally signs the certificate with its private key and sends it back to the applicant. This is the certificate which will be used by the applicant in order to authenticate any clients who may reach to him. We already know that all our controller components are only virtual devices and they will get the root certificate in their OS itself. But to get a signed certificate, they must go to a certificate authority. There is multiple options available for Cisco sd WAN in which it can get a signed certificate. First one is automated semantic or digicert based signing, manual semantic or a digicert model, automated Cisco PKI based CA, manual Cisco PKI model, and finally the customer owned enterprise certificate authority. Out of all these options, the current recommended option by Cisco is automated Cisco PKI certificate signing. Now we will look into details of the automated Cisco PKI certificate signing method and the enterprise CA model. In our lab today, we will use the fifth option which is enterprise based CA model. Okay, let's start with the automated Cisco PKI server model. If you see my screen, we do have an admin and vManage, vSmart and vBond and a Cisco PKI server. Now let's see the process in which uh, we can get a signed certificate for the vManage himself. The administrator first logs into the vManage and initiates a CSR for the vManage itself. Then the vManage will automatically submit the CSR to the Cisco PKI server hosted in internet. For this the vManage will need internet access and also DNS resolution should be proper. Followed by that, the CSR is automatically approved and signed by the Cisco PKI server and then vManage will be automatically retrieving that signed certificate from the Cisco PKI server. Basically, the vManage continuously tries to the Cisco PKI server whether or not the certificate is signed and ready. So once ready, he will just retrieve it. Now vManage after receiving the signed certificate, he will install the signed certificate since it is for himself. Now let's back off for a second. Now let's say we need to get vSmart and vBond a signed certificate. Here in this case vManage will act as a proxy. First the admin will log into the vManage and initiate a CSR but this time it will be for either vSmart or vBond. When the admin does that, right, vManage initiates a netcon for vSmart and vBond and then he will request them for a CSR in the backend and he will obviously get the CSR for them. Once the vManage gets the CSR, he will submit it to the Cisco PKI server. Cisco PKI server will approve that CSR and give a signed certificate. So vManage will retrieve that signed certificate. This time vManage will know that the certificate is not for himself so he will render it to vSmart and vBond. This is how the Cisco PKI server automated method will work. 
Here we do have an enterprise CA server, we manage vbond vsmart and an admin. Remember the controllers will have a root certificate only for Cisco or uh, Symantec or DigiCert based CAs. It will not have an enterprise based custom root certificate, right? So the first step here is uh, we have to get the root certificate from this enterprise CA and then give it to the vManage vbond and vsmart. First the administrator retries the root certificate from the enterprise CA server and he logs into the vManage and uploads the root certificate and then vManage will help us in installing that root certificate into the vbond and vsmart as well. Once this process is done, then the administrator initiates a CSR. It can be either for the vManage himself or for the vbond or vsmart and then he manually downloads the copy of CSR, takes it to the enterprise CA server and then he will sign it manually in the enterprise CA server retrieves the signed certificate, upload it back to the vManage. If the certificate is for vManage himself, vManage will install it or if it is for the vbond and vsmart, it will render it to them. This is how the enterprise based CA model will work in Cisco ST1. Let us have a quick look at the XCA application which will act as the enterprise root CA in our lab. We have detailed videos about how to install this XCA application and create a root certificate from the same. Check out the playlist link in the description box and also I have given the particular videos in the cards as well. I have already installed the XCA application in my jump box and also I have already created a root certificate. When I click on this root certificate, we will be able to see more details about this root certificate. And I do have created this root certificate with a 10 year of validity. Plus these are the details which I have given when creating this root certificate. If you are looking for more details about how to install this XCA application and how to create a root certificate for our lab topology, I request you to visit the videos available in our Cisco SD1 video series. The link for the video series is given in the description box. For now, this is the root certificate which we are going to use in this lab topology. Also, I have exported this root certificate out into this jump box already. So when we are in the stage of creating our controllers and getting them signed, we will come back to this XCA with a CSR from them and then get them signed here and go back and install them there. Now let's see about the lab topology that we are going to use today. How I have built the lab in my server. What is the version that we will use in our demo. Just in case if you still haven't downloaded our lab topology diagram, it is available in the description box. Please do download and keep a separate hot copy or soft copy as you wish. But I feel if you have a hard copy, specifically a color printout, it will be great. We will use 20.6x code for vManage, vbond, vsmart, vhcloud and 17.6x for the Catalyst 8k vRouters. We will use minimum specs for vManage, vbond, vsmart or vanage routers, not the Cisco recommended specs because obviously this is our lab environment. vManage, vbond and vsmart will be brought up in ESXi directly as a VM whereas I will bring up all the vanage routers inside a GNSP project. Okay, let's explore the lab topology now. First, to start off, we do have a data center with uh, two CAT 8KV routers. And then uh, on the bottom, we do have uh, two branch routers, branch one and branch two. Each of the branches have only one SD1 routers. And uh, we do have two transports, MPLS and internet. The internet that I have shown in the data center is just an internet which is going to help us in uh, reaching the actual internet applications, right? Whereas this internet on the bottom is the one where uh, all the SD-WAN routers will connect and then use that as a actual transport where uh, they will build tunnels over this internet. Think like uh, I have this from uh, ISP1 and this is from ISP2, right? And in the data center, we do have two different uh, VPNs, which is uh, VPN 10 and VPN 20. VPN 10 is a user data VPN and I do have a server in data center, which is residing in VPN 10. And VPN 20 is a voice VPN. I do have a CUCM server maybe, right? Think this as a CUCM server or a phone or whatever it is. I do have an endpoint there, right, for our lab. If I come to the branch, 
same thing i do have vpn 10 and vpn 20 there as well vpn 10 uh, a user machine is sitting there in vpn 10 and we do have a voice phone sitting in vpn 20 same thing goes for branch 2 as well and if you see here we do have a cloud hosted in it when i say cloud hosted it is not actually hosted in the cloud it is in my lab logically i'm going to call this as the cloud i will extend the gns3 this inet which is available inside gns3 to the outside world so that it can communicate with my vms which are these controller vms available in the esxi i will walk you through this in great detail when we do the demos i do have separate slides showing each sites separately data center branch 1 and branch 2 if you see data center we do have two transport connectivity and uh, if you notice the interface number it's uh, colored in pink if you see the legend it says that uh, whenever uh, you see that color that means it's uh, vpn 0 that interface will be assigned under vpn 0 if you see some interface colored as uh, green it will be assigned under vpn 10 this is the reason uh, which uh, i have requested you to take a color printout so that uh, when you reference you will be able to see these color codings as well even when you see the mpls links or internet links or the internal links i do have given them in separate colors so that uh, you can understand that clearly this is the topology diagram for branch one and followed by that we also have one for branch two we will discuss this in detail and obviously we are going to use these diagrams when we build up our demos. We will now spin up the vManage, vBond and vSmart VMs in our ESXi server and then followed by that we will do some required settings. Plus let us also just assign an IP address to these devices so we can easily access them via SSH or HTTPS as needed. Let's get started here. I am in the ESXi server now. If you see, I do already have installed vManage, vSmart and vBond VMs just to save time in our video. What I will do, I will just quickly show you how to install a VM in this uh, ESXi. First click on create register VM and then select OVF or OVFI. Click next and then give a name. So for now, let me give test. And then select the OVA file for the VM which you are trying to bring up. Say for example, let's uh, do this one for now. Right, select, click next. And then select the data store, click next. Select the NIC cards and the VLANs as per your design. And uh, power on automatically. I am removing that. And click on next and finish. Once you finish, the file will be uploaded and the VMs will be created. That is the stage the vms are in right i haven't completed the basic configurations in the vm i just spun them up in the esxi let me click on this v manage right click edit settings if you see here when i created the v manage i have edited the cpu and memory to be 16 and uh, 16 this will not be the case in a production environment always refer to the cisco recommended guide to set the correct cpu and memory as per your design if you see i do have added this hard disk additionally which is around 100 gb so i have done that by clicking add hard disk and click new standard hard disk that will add an extra hard disk and then i have assigned all the nics under vm network i do have a flat network in my lab topology let me cancel this same thing i have done for vsmart and vbond as well i have just edited the cpu and memory for them apart from that there is no other things which we have to do for vsmart and vbond we don't need an extra hard disk and all only vmanage needs an extra hard disk that is for the statistics collection in the vmanage what we'll do now is we'll get into these boxes and then just assign them an ip address so that we can get into them via ssh which will be easy for us rather than a console so let's start with the vmanage right click console let's first log into the vmanage just asks you to change the password i'm changing the password the first step it asks you is uh, you have added an extra hard disk so what should i do with that hard disk right and also in the latest version it will ask you what i am right whether i'm going to act both as compute and data or i'm going to act only as a data or compute if you are doing a standalone vmanage 
you should always select option one in case if you have a cluster this option will vary right you may have one vmanage doing only data and the other vmanage doing only compute right so let me click one and then yes you see it have detected the extra hard disk which we have created so it's requesting us whether it's going to use that for the storage yes okay to format now the vmanage will reboot and come back up so let's give it some time we'll come back to the vmanage meanwhile let's get into the vsmart and then assign them the ip as planned default username password is admin admin I'm changing the password So let's use Ethernet 0 as planned, VPN 0, interface, Ethernet 0, IP address 192.168.0.53 slash 24, no shutdown, right, let's do this, IP route 0, 0, 0, 0. This is our gateway as per our plan. Let's comment and comment and quit. Let us quickly check this configuration. VPN zero. Yes. So if you see, I haven't done anything else apart from just assigning an IP address. We will come back and do further configurations in a later section. So let's quickly get here and I do already have created these things. So let me double click on vSmart. Yes, we are able to SSH into the vSmart. Let's just quickly get in and check. Yes, we are in the vSmart now. Same way, let's go ahead and get into the vBond console. Admin, admin change the password and then if you see here show interface tab so I'm going to use gigi 0 and let me get into VPN 0 interface gigabit 0 IP address 192.168.0.52 as per our plan and slash 24 no shutdown one more thing to note here is the vbond doesn't have a separate OVA file. We will use the vedge image to bring up a vbond. We'll spin up a vedge image in the ESXi and then we'll get into the vedge router and we will enable the vbond process in the vedge so that it starts acting as a vbond. Since by default this is a vedge router, every interface will be enabled with tunnel. So what we have to do is we have to allow all service so that we can uh, SSH into this box. Let me do this as well and then let me add the static default route. Euro fifty commit and quit. Okay. Now let's me get back here. Let's check vbond. Yes, unable to get into the vbond. Yes. So, so we have the vsmart and vbond accessible from our jump box. So let's get back and see what's the status of our vmanage now. We have rebooted him, right? Let's go back there. Yes, he's ready, I think. Let's check. Here you go. Yes, I'm going to use the same ETH0 here as we did in vSmart. VPN0, interface ETH0, IP address 192.168.0.51 slash 24, no shutdown. IP route. Zero dot fifty is the next up. Let's commit and quit. Let's get back here. Check we manage. Yes, we are able to get into the V manage as well. 
one more thing let me show you this if you see these are the image files which i have used to bring up the vms in the esxi server viptala edge this is for the vbond viptala smart and viptala vmanage for the vmanage itself and we are running 26.1 version in the controllers now we have remote access to all our controllers only the controllers will come up directly in esxi server as vm the other components in the topology as described in the diagram will come up in gns3 server to save time i have already created this lab topology in gns3 now let me just walk through this quickly so you can be in sync with me let me give you a quick walk through of our gns3 topology if you remember i have told you that uh, we will bring up the controllers directly as a vm in the esxi whereas all the edge routers will be created in a gns3 project so if you see my screen this is the gns3 project which i have created this is as per the lab topology diagram which i have shared to you there is a dc router 1 dc router 2 and behind that there is a dc switch which is an access osv and uh, uh, dc server dc phone and uh, i don't have real internet so i have simulated the internet with a router here and also there is the internet cloud mpls cloud which are again simulated with a router only if you see here i do have netum this is for inducing latency in the link i'd say the link from branch router 1 to the mpls if i want to increase the latency here i will use this application to increase the latency loss and jitter right followed by that we have our branch router 1 and branch router 2 with their respective end hosts if you see here the inet 1 it has some connectivity to the internet service and also i have extended and connectivity to the outside network since all the edges are residing inside the gns3 as a project it needs some way to reach to the controllers which is sitting as a vm in the esxi itself right so there is an option in gns3 in which we can extend the connectivity from the virtual routers inside the project to the external network so that is what i have done so that these routers will be able to reach to the controllers and also i have completed configuring this mpls and inet so we will not be doing configurations for these routers in this video it is already configured whereas the dc switch is also partially configured meaning i have already configured internet connectivity for this router so if i go to this dc switch now and ping the internet server ips which i have created in this router i will be able to ping them same way from internet one also i should be able to ping those internet servers and also i have already logged into this server phone and also in the end host of branch one and branch two i have assigned them an ip address and set a default route as well if you see our lab topology diagram the phones will get dhcp ip address from their respective routers so what i have done is i have went into this interface and then configured it to get a dhcp ip as well so all the end host respective configurations are completed and uh, the mpls and the internet cloud configurations are completed and also the internet server related configurations are completed so we will focus majorly on the sd1 router configuration in this video plus some lan related configurations which i kept pending we will do that together in this video as well So far, we have created the vManage, vBond and vSmart VMs in the ESXi, but we haven't configured them. In this section, we will prepare the basic configuration needed for our vManage and also there is some initial settings needed to be done via the GUI, which we will do. Also, we will install the enterprise root certificate onto the vManage. I am in the vManage SSH terminal. I have already created a basic configuration template for this vManage. Let me open that yes if you see here this is the template which we are going to use we will fill up this template so that we will be able to build the basic configuration required to bring up the vManage so to start off we do have the system level configurations which covers host name location system ip site id organization name what's the time zone and also who's the vbond if you see i have given the vbond as lab.vbond.com and again, I have created a host entry for that lab.vbond.com we have QDN, right? If in case you have a DNS server in your real production, you might use the DNS server to resolve this. And followed by that, we do have the VPN0 configurations. If you remember, VPN0 is the transport VPN. 
Under that, we have configured the DNS and also the host entry, as I told you. Plus, this is the WAN interface of the vManage. And we'll configure an IP address and we'll configure that as a tunnel interface. So let's start preparing this configuration. Host name is going to be vManage. Location, I'm going to use Chennai. And this lat long I have already pulled out from the internet and uh, pasted. System IP is going to be 1111 and uh, site ID is going to be 1. System IP, site ID, these things I have planned for my lab network. If in case you are doing this in your production, it depends on the scale of deployment. We, will, we have to plan that properly. And the organization name for our lab will be Let me use that. Now clock time zone will be Asia, Kolkata, Vbon lab. Okay. And uh, DNS server, I'm going to use 4222. Secondary is going to be 8888. And the Vbond IP in our network should be 052 as per our plan. And ETH0 is the interface. And if you remember, the IP which we have configured for the vManage is 192.168.051.24. Tunnel interface, I'm going to allow service all. We will not configure anything else there. Since this is my lab and to keep it simple, I am allowing all service. And in case if you are doing this in production, you may allow only specific services which are required. In most of the cases, controllers will be sitting in a data center and we will definitely have a firewall before them. Right. So the security should be taken care of. The next stop default route should be 192.168.050. That's it. This is the basic configuration. Let me copy this get into the vManage config t paste it yes save the configuration we are done with the basic configuration for vManage via cli we have to get into the vManage via gui and also do some basic configurations there let's get into the vManage gui now here i am in the vManage gui if you see it's https 192.168.0.51 colon 8443 that's how you access the gui of the vManage we'll use the same credentials let me do one thing quickly yes let's log in now here you go we are in the dashboard of the vManage we'll come back to this later Let's get into the administration and the settings page. Here in the settings page, we must do some configurations. Yes, we'll get into the organization name and uh, this is our organization name. Save. We bond lab.vbond.com save alarms notification nothing hardware vanage certificate we are going to leave it to be default on box controller certificate authorization we are going to change that to be enterprise root certificate yes proceed here i have to select a file and then if you remember i have created our root certificate right i have to select that root certificate Yes, the vManage have taken the root certificate. Let me also set the CSR properties. This is the properties which we have used while creating the root certificate. And uh, it will be city, San Jose, state, CA. And then organization will be Viptela LNC country code us email 2020 at uh, it's 2020 at gmail.com and the domain name is proxy.victella.com and uh, the validity i'm going to select it to be three years okay let's go ahead and click import and save yes it saved successfully let's go back vanage cloud certificate i'm going to leave it to be automatic 
web certificate we are not going to do that thing so let's quickly check the banner we'll enable a banner I'm just giving a random value here uh, if you are doing this in a production you must take care and put that as per your uh, office standards let's quickly go down statistics settings we'll come back to these things when needed here it is the tenancy mode we are going to use single tenant so we will not touch that and then smart account credentials in case if you are using the Cisco based automatic certificate authority, we should have given the smart account credentials. But uh, since we are using enterprise CA, we can skip that for now. And apart from that, I don't think we need any other basic configurations. Yes, we are good now with the vManage. We have configured the vManage via CLI and as well as via the GUI. In this section, we will generate a CSR from the vManage, from the vManage GUI and submit it to the enterprise CA server to get a signed certificate. Once the signed certificate for the vManage is available, we will upload it back to the vManage. Okay, let's go. Let's get into the vManage configuration devices page. If you see under controllers, we do only have the vManage and uh, it is in sync and certificate status is not installed right if i go to configuration certificates under controllers we still have the vManage but we don't have an expiry date or we don't have a, a certificate installed here as well let's get a csr generated now click here and then click generate csr download the csr we manage CSR is downloaded. Let's close this. Close. Let me open up the XEA and here click import. Select the CSR from we manage. Okay. Right click. Sign him. And uh, these options are good. And this should be this. Use this certificate. Restore all default extensions type end entity critical this and i'm going to use it for three years the key usage digital key and cipher month netscape all these three ca's nothing in advance nothing in comments let's click ok yes we have generated the certificate if i go to certificates under the root certificate we will see the vmanage certificate let's export that I'm going to export it to the yes I'm going to export it to here let's save it here it's going to be in PEM format okay yes we have exported the certificate let's come back to the vManage and click install certificate let's select a file and then choose all files yes here it is the vManage certificate now when I install the vManage knows that the certificate is for himself so that he will install the certificate to himself this complete yes it's a success if i go back here under configuration certificates controllers you see here we do have the certificate installed successfully and also let me get into the vManage cli and do a show control local properties if I scroll up a bit, hold on. Here we go. The certificate is installed and the validity is up to May 20, 2025. So we are good with the vManage. vManage is configured and it is certified. Now we will prepare the basic configuration needed for our vBond device and followed by that we will see how we can request vManage to help us in uploading the enterprise root certificate to the vBond, get the CSR generated from the vBond and sign and upload it back to the vBond. Everything can be done from the vManage GUI itself. Let's see how this goes. 
We do have SSH access to the vBond already and also I have a template for the vBond basic configuration. Let us fill the template. This is very similar to what I have done for vManage. The host name is vBond location. Let's keep it the same one. Let long, let it be that. System IP 1112. We have used 1114 for vManage. We are going to use 1112 for vBond. Site ID 1, they are going to be in the same site. And lab, this is our org name. Let's keep the time zone to be Asia Kolkata. This is the key factor. If you see, there is an extra keyword here which states local, right? This will indicate the VH that he should act as a VBOND. He is not going to act as a VH, right? This is a critical keyword. And then under VPN0, we have to give DNS. For VBOND, we really don't need DNS until or unless you need to ping a, a QDN from a VBOND. We are going to remove that and we we'll move forward with VBOND IP, which is 52. We will tell the VBOND about the VBOND himself, right? And uh, interface is gigi00, IP address of the VBOND is so 52 as per our plan, 24. And when you are creating a VBOND, we can create it with the tunnel interface or we can also remove it the tunnel interface altogether. So for simplicity, I'm going to remove the tunnel interface and the next stop will be 192.168.0.50. This is it. Let me copy this, get back to the VBond, paste it, commit and quit. So interface tab, my bad. Here you see the configurations have been taken successfully. Yes, yes that's good. VBond doesn't have a GUI. We don't need to do any other configurations. We are ready to certify the VBond now. Let's get into the vManage and uh, we'll go into configuration devices and under controllers add controller vbond ip address of the vbond 0 0.52 what the vmanage will do is vmanage will connect to the vbond and then he will help vbond to get a signed certificate I'm going to remove this option. We will do this manually. Let's click add. Yes, the device is added, but certificate is not yet installed. Let's go to configuration certificates. Now under controllers. Yes, from here, I'm going to ask the vManage, hey, get the CSR from the vBond. So, now he got the CSR from vBond. He would have queried the vBond in the backend and got this CSR from him. Now let's download this. Why vManage is acting as a proxy here? Because vBond and vSmart doesn't have a GUI interface, right? It's easy to do things via GUI. So vBond is acting as a proxy and helping us here. Here is the CSR which is generated but the name seems to be undefined. I'm going to just change it to be vBond so that in case if we want to reference it later we will be able to identify it, right? So I have changed it. Let me open my XCA. Yes, under here let me import the vBond CSR successfully imported. Right click, sign him. use this certificate extensions it's an end entity critical it's gonna be for three years apply key usage digital signature key encipherment let's keep all three CAs nothing in advance nothing in comment let's click OK yes successfully created let's go here you see there is a vbond certificate available now let's export Yes, I'm going to export it there. Let's click OK. 
you see there is a v bond certificate now we have to get back to the v manage v manage is the one who is going to help uh, throughout this process right install certificate select a file this time let me choose the v bond certificate v manage will know that this is for the v bond so he will install it to the v bond it's a success let's get into the v bond if i do a show control local properties you see a certificate is installed in the v bond mainly if you are doing anything in v bond you should always use show orchestrator that is the correct accurate command for uh, v bond say example if you are doing show control connections or show control local properties in v manage and v smart the equivalent command in v bond will be show orchestrator local properties and show orchestrator connections so let's do this as well certificate is installed and this is the certificate validity now both v manage and v bond have their respective certificates ready so what do we expect we expect them to form dtls tunnels between them let's just quickly validate that in v bond as i told you we should do show orchestrator connections Yes, if you see, we do have multiple connections to the vManage. This is basically from every core of the vManage, vManage will initiate a control connection. That's why there is multiple connections. Show control local, no, my bad. Show control connections. Yes, you see, we do have control connections to the vBond. In this section, we will prepare the configuration needed for our vSmart device and followed by that, we will see how we can request vManage to help us in uploading the enterprise root certificate to the vSmart and get CSR generated from vSmart, sign and upload it back to the vSmart. Everything can be done from the vManage GUI itself as we just done for the vBond. Let's see how this goes. Here is the vSmart configuration template. Let's start with the host name, location. System IP, site ID is going to be 1, org name is this, and then we don't need DNS at least for this lab topology, and who's the V bond, V bond is 1 1.0.52 vSmart interface is 80 as per our plan and vSmart IP is 192.168.0.53 slash 24 and uh, I'm gonna just keep it simple by allowing all service and the next stop should be dot 50 let's copy this get into the vSmart CLI config terminal paste it commit and quit okay let's quickly check the control local properties still the certificate is not installed so the next step is we have to request we manage to help us in getting a certificate for the vSmart same way we did for the vBond let's do that Let's get back in vManage GUI configuration devices and under controllers add controller this time it's vSmart IP is 192.168.0.53 username password I'm gonna remove generate CSR in case if I do this right it will automatically generate the CSR I don't want to do that let's do it uh, one step at a time let's add this yes successfully added and uh, let's go to certificates under controllers yes for vSmart generate a CSR it's download you see the CSR is downloaded let's close this let me navigate to that path here you go again the name is undefined I'm gonna change it to be vSmart and then open XCA 
get under this tab import import v smart click ok and then right click sign this csr use this for signing and then extensions is an end entity critical this and three apply key usage digital signature key in cipherment here we have to select all three CAs nothing in advance nothing in common for now let's click OK yes signed successfully go under certificates here it is export yes uh, yeah I want it to be in this path let's click OK yeah you see here the certificate is available now let's go back to vManage install a certificate select a file show me all the files where it is yeah here it is be smart click install now we manage will install the certificate into the vSmart let that go parallelly let's go to the vSmart and do the command again yes you see certificate is installed now and if you remember we have installed the root certificate for the vManage only right how did vBond and vSmart got the root certificate when we added the device here in uh, vManage right we added uh, let me go here we added vbond and vsmart under this devices tab isn't it during that time vManage will automatically install the root certificate that he have the enterprise root certificate right into vsmart and vbond so that's an automated process one final thing let's check the control connections of the vsmart we expect control connections to both vbond and vManage we have four control connections to the vbond that is because vsmart have four cores and he will go and register about all those four cores to the vbond whereas uh, between vmanage and vsmart there will be only one control connection okay now it's time for us to explore a bit into the current status of our lab network and also we will quickly validate the same the controls are brought up successfully if I get into the vManage and uh, under configuration certificates under controllers we see that all three controllers our uh, operational status uh, is vbond updated installed and the certificate serial number is available and uh, we'll see an expiry date as well right that means they have a valid certificate here in the vManage CLI, if I do a show control connections, we see we have control connections to both vSmart and vBond. Same way, when I get into vBond, we have control connection. To both vBond, uh, okay, so as I told you, it should have been show orchestrator connections. Yeah, we have to both vSmart and vManage as we expect it to be. vSmart have control connections as well. Let's do this. Here we go. This is the current status of our lab. We'll start off with the edge routers onboarding now. Before we start to bring up the SD1 edge routers, we need to discuss on some important topics. Let's start with the discussion about how the different devices are uniquely identified in the Cisco ST1 overlay and also the steps for manual deployment of Cisco ST1 edges. We will not be discussing about ZTP zero touch provisioning feature of Cisco ST1. Again, you can check out our other video series for the same. VH hardware have the certificate signed by Avnet and burned into the trusted platform module TPM chip. Symantec, DigiCert and Cisco root certificates are preloaded into the software. Enterprise root certificates will be loaded manually, distributed automatically by vManage or we also install them during the ZTP process. Except asr 1002 x all CH hardware have secure unique device identifier which is a SUDI. This is an x509 v3 certificate associated with a key pair that is protected in hardware SUDI chip. 
Symantec DG cert or Cisco root certificates are preloaded in the software. Enterprise root certificates are again uploaded manually and also we can install it via PNP automatic process. Enterprise root certificates are manually uploaded or we can use the PNP auto provisioning method as well. VH cloud routers, CAT 8KVs or Cisco ASR 1002X routers, they do not have a certificate or serial number. So an OTP that is generated by the vManage will be configured during the deployment process which they will use for the temporary identity. After temporary authentication, a permanent serial number and a certificate is provided to them by the vManage which they will use to come up in the network as like any other hardware devices. The vManage will act as a certificate authority for vanage cloud routers and the ASR 1002X. vManage distributes the WebTLR root certificates automatically to vBond and vSmart. After vanage routers are authenticated using OTP, vManage CA issues them WebTLR signed certificates which will be used by the virtual edge routers to do further overlay authentications. Now let's look at the manual deployment process of a hardware vanage router whether it is a VH or a CH. First we'll get into the console of the router and then we will paste in the basic configurations which we have prepared. If you remember the router already have a serial number and a certificate built in. So with the serial number, certificate and along with the basic configuration details he will reach out to the vbond and once it is authenticated successfully vbond will share the vManage and vSmart data so that he will reach out to the vManage and vSmart and authenticate as well. Once this step is done, he knows about the other vanages as well from vSmart so that he can form BFDs which is IPsec tunnels. Let's see how a virtual edge router manual deployment process happens. There is two steps. One, first the virtual edge router doesn't have a serial number and a certificate. He needs to get a serial number and a certificate from the vManage. Let's see how that process works which is step one. In the vManage we will generate a UUID and a OTP for this specific virtual router and then this data will be shared to the vBond as well. Then the administrator will copy the UUID and OTP and get into the console of the virtual vanage router and paste it in. Also he will put the basic configuration as required. Once the virtual edge router have this data, he will reach out to the vBond with the UUID and the OTP. vBond will authenticate the OTP and once the authentication is successful, he will redirect the virtual vanage to the vManage. Next the virtual vanage will go to the vManage along with the UUID and OTP. vManage will authenticate the UUID and OTP. If it is successful, he will assign a serial number, a permanent serial number and a signed certificate to the virtual vanage router. Now the vanage router has a serial number and a signed certificate. Now he is good to start the next level of process which is forming permanent DTLS tunnels. Whatever tunnels have been formed so far are all temporary connections which will be terminated immediately after this. Now this virtual vanage router have a serial number and a certificate for himself. In the ninth step he will reach out to the vBond but this time the authentication will be based on the certificate and the serial number. Once authenticated, vBond will share vManage and vSmart data so he will get authenticated with them also with the certificate and the serial number. Once that authentication is successful, vSmart will share the data about other vanage routers in the network. So this router will establish BFD tunnels which is IPsec tunnels to the other vanage router. So this is how a manual provisioning works for hardware router and virtual routers as well. Virtual routers does have some additional steps in which they have to get a serial number and a signed certificate for them. Remember in our lab all we have is virtual routers. Whatever we have discussed about this virtual edge manual deployment is a key thing for you to remember so that it's going to help you to easily follow me when I'm building the lab. In this next section, we will discuss about TLOC extension. This is one of the key features of Cisco SD1. Let's start. TLOC extension is basically an option by which we extend and transport circuit from one router to another router so that the other router will believe that he have a direct connectivity to the transport. 
In this example, if you see that manager router 1 only have MPLS link terminated to him, manager router 2 have internet link terminated on him. So now we will discuss in detail how we can extend MPLS to router 2 and internet to router 1. If you see the diagram, on the left side we have Vantage 1, on the right side we have Vantage 2. In Vantage 1, I do have shown VPN 0 separately and VPN 10 for example, a service VPN which I have shown here. And same goes for Vantage 2 as well. And uh, we do have MPLS and internet transports. MPLS transport is connected to the Vantage 1 on Gigabit 00 port in VPN 0s. In a similar way, internet link is terminated to Gigi 00 of Vantage 2 which belongs to VPN 0 as well. Just for this discussion sake, I have numbered this TLOC as T1 and T3 so that uh, it will be easier for me to explain to you. The intention here is this uh, TLOC 1 which is available in uh, Edge Router 1 should be extended to Vantage 2. TLOC 3 which is available in uh, Edge Router 2 should be extended to Vantage 1. Let's start with TLOC 1 getting extended to Vantage 2. What are the steps? First, we will build a interconnect link on VPN 0 between these two routers, which is Gigi 01. Technically, this can be a physical interface or even you can carve out a sub interface from an existing physical interface between these two routers. Both options should work. And then if you see on the screen, we do have assigned subnet A for this gigabit 01, right? The next step, we will advertise this subnet A into the MPLS cloud. The subnet A may be a slash 30 as well, right? Moving on, what we will do is we will get into this interface on the Vantage router 1 and then we will tell him that you are a TLOC extension of Gigi00. So let me just repeat this here. We will get into this interface, right? Who is basically going to help us in extending this TLOC. So we'll get into that interface template, right? Technically speaking, when we go into the vManage, we'll do it via template. We get into the template of this interface and then we will tell that Gigi00, you are going to extend to the other direction. We will not tell him that you are extending to this so and so router and all. We will just tell him that you are going to extend Gigi00 transport via this interface. That's it. And then on Vantage2, what should we do? On Vantage2, we don't do anything. We will just go ahead and configure this interface as transport2, which is basically the same color as this transport1, right? What this Vantage2 believes is he have a direct connectivity to MPLS. That's what he believes. And also we do add static routes as necessary or uh, it may be a routing protocol as per the design. Vantage2 believes that now he have T3 which is uh, internet and he also have a link to MPLS. So that when there is some traffic on the LAN side, he is ready to load share it via both the circuits. Obviously, when he puts some traffic on this T2, it's physically going to go via Vantage 1, but uh, Vantage 2 is completely unaware about that. Now remember, this whatever we have done is an MPLS extension, basically private color extension. Now what we are going to do here on the other end is we are going to extend a public color. So there is two challenges in internet extension. One is uh, we have to pay for the WAN IP subnet, which is going to be a public IP, right? So when we extend it to the other router, so basically we have to create similarly we have to create extra interface for that interface we need a public ip as well right generally speaking but that is not the case we can assign a private ip there and then when the traffic goes out we can ask the router to nat it to the ip address on e 0 of vantage 2 so let's see how that works that is just to save public ip space but technically you can even assign a public ip address without doing that we will create a link between VPN zeros of these two routers and in this example I have assigned subnet B think of subnet B as a private IP right and then we will enable NAT on Gigi00 interface on Vantage2 then we will get into this router interface right Vantage2 this particular interface the one I am highlighting and then we will tell him that you should extend Gigi00 
into your other direction right so that's where we will do p lock extension and then we will go into vantage 1 we will configure this end of the interface as transport interface which is basically with a public color same as t3 right and then obviously we'll add a default root as we require now vantage 1 believes that he have t1 t4 which is a private color and also he have a public color which is mpls and internet connection this is how both routers believes that they have direct leg to mpls and internet but in reality vantage 1 have to go through vantage 2 in order to use internet same goes for vantage 2 when he wants to use the mpls he should go via the vantage 1 physically but each router is completely another that they are traversing via the other router in the same site let us start to bring up the sd1 routers in data center and follow that up by configuring all lan components as well the core switch end host whatever i have let's do everything there before we start in cisco sd1 everything is template driven there is two types of template one feature template and another one is device template feature template is nothing but uh, say for example if you have ospf ehrp or an interface or the vpn1 routing table right for every set of pieces we will create a separate feature template say for example for the dhcp or uh, for the ntp configurations for each of them we will create a separate feature template and then we will bind everything into the device template then this device template will be the one which is getting attached to the edge routers so when we want to bring up the data center routers obviously we need to create multiple feature templates let's quickly see what are the feature templates which are required to bring up our data center site here on sd1 router 1 we have the gigabit 1 interface connecting to mpls gigabit 2 on sd1 router 2 connecting to internet and as well as there is a t-lock extension which i am going to do between these two routers and there is two lan interfaces one which is going to connect for vpn 10 in host and the other one is for vpn 20 same from edge router 2 as well so for everything we need to create a separate feature templates so let's see what are those to start off we do have the system template this is a global template this basically carries the details of uh, site id system ip or name those kind of details will be carried in this system feature template so what i mean by new is there is reusability right the bigger advantage of using template model is reusability so since this is the first thing which we are bringing up in the network and this is the first time we are creating system template we are going to create it as a new maybe for the future sites no need for us to create again we can reuse this so that's why i mentioned new whenever i mention new it's something new which we are going to create followed by that we will create a triple template for authentication bfd this is where we will give the values uh, which is hello and uh, the multiplier values security template where we will define security parameters and uh, omp template omp parameters and we are going to do a banner as well followed by that we will create a localized policy where we will uh, enable dpi and c flow this is just to enable the router to do deep packet inspection followed by that we will create a vpn0 template this template is just for the vpn0 you can think like uh, for vrf0 we are creating a separate template if you are not able to follow that clearly about these templates don't worry we are going to do things uh, together in the lab demo i hope that will make things clear for you followed by that we will create a mpls interface template if you see we do have a mpls interface in our design so we need a mpls interface template and then an internet interface template and we also need a t-lock extension interface template right who is going to extend the t-lock all these templates will go under vpn0 i'll show you that as well and we will create a parent interface template what is the parent interface basically in cisco sd1 the thumb rule is that the main interface from where the sub interface is carved out should always have an higher mtu than the sub interface it should be at least four bytes higher right say if you have a gigabit one and you carved out gigabit 1.100 sub interface so in this case gigabit one can be 1504 and gigabit 1.100 can be 1500 or 
you can make gigabit 1 as 1500 and keep uh, gigabit 1.100 as 1496 either of that work the only rule is the sub interface should be 4 bytes lower than the physical interface to achieve this and also to create the main interface for the sub interface which we have between the two routers if you see the diagram we do have sub interface gigabit 3.100 and 3.200 so obviously we need gigabit 3 interface right the main interface created on both the routers so for that we will use this template and then we are going to create vpn 10 template right that's the service vpn template and in that service vpn we have one lan interface and also if you see the diagram we are going to enable ospf for that we need a separate template plus we need a vpn 20 separate template vpn 20 lan interface and if you see the diagram i'm going to enable vrrp on vpn 20 interfaces between the two routers so i'm going to create a separate vrrp template and finally we are going to create a dhcp server template if you see the diagram for the voice phone over there i haven't assigned an ip address rather i just mentioned it as dhcp so he's going to get a dhcp ip from the router who's going to act as a dhcp server so for that we need a separate template in vmanage let's navigate to configuration templates and under feature templates let's click add template and then the device version in our lab is cat 8 kv so let me select that the first one which we are going to bring up is a system template let's click and then we'll name this as cisco system or we can make everything is fine. let us system. anything should be fine its name and give a description site id it's going to be device specific so there is two values if you see here global and device specific when you select global wherever the template gets assigned this value will be pushed and if you select it to be device specific when you assign this template to a device and uh, attach the template right the device template that is when the vmanage will prompt you to fill the value for this device so we have kept it to be device specific it will prompt us to fill the site id when we attach the device template to the router system ip let it be device specific overlay if you see this there is third option which is default say there is always a default parameters for our cisco routers isn't it say um, by default ospf timer hello timer there is values correct so if you leave this to be default it will take the default value same way time zone by default it's utc we are going to change it globally right so we'll have the same value everywhere so it's better to keep it global so let me pick our time zone yes asia kolkata host name will be unique for every router so let it be device specific location let it be device specific as well device group control group we are not going to touch those things for now console baud rate i'm going to keep it to be 9600 for every box so that's why i'm putting it as global lat long i'm not going to be doing that uh, but in case uh, you are doing this in production you may need that tracker we don't need a tracker at least for now port hopping port offset okay so as per cisco guidelines we need to enable port hopping in branch locations whereas we should disable it in the hub locations so i'll keep this as device specific if we are pushing the same system template to a branch and a data center in our lab topology i will turn this on in the branch whereas i will turn it off in the data center port offset track transport other things i think are good we can save this the next template which we have planned is let's click here again select so template creation is a little hectic process but remember it's always one time right think about thousand two thousand sites which, which you may have in your production right 
you can restrict it with uh, maybe 10 to 15 templates depending on the design or the way you plan it to be let's give the template name as cisco triple a and then i'm going to only use local credentials so let me create a local credential i'm just changing the default password here the default password is always admin admin i'm changing it and then if i go down techx dot uh, one x i'm not going to do anything i'll go here and then i will add the authentication order to be local so that's the only option because i haven't created techx or radius while if i create one it will show the techx or radius as well here okay let's save this next one bfd let's create that Cisco BFT Cisco BFT I'm going to leave this multiplier polling interval these are all things related to the loss latency checker which is captured by the SD manager router let's move down for color say we are going to have two colors in our network one for MPLS and one is public internet so let's choose MPLS. Let's leave the hello interval for the BFT tunnel to be one second and multiplier as seven. Let's leave it to be default. And say add. Even if you don't do this template, it's going to take the default value. But I just wanted to show you this so that you can uh, do this if you need, right? So just in case if you are playing around with the BFT values, uh, hello interval and multiplier values, uh, you would have changed that as well but in my lab i'm not going to do that i'll just keep it simple so i have two colors right so whatever you see here on the bottom this is for the tunnel hello and multiplier whereas the top one is related with the loss latency jitter parameters which is captured by the cisco st1 let's save this add and 8000 cat 8 kv and then let's select omp now let's name it as cisco omp and uh, i'm not going to do anything okay graceful restart timer is uh, uh, say for example when you have uh, lost your control connections to all the controllers still the edge routers can survive on their own right they will not drop the ipsec tunnels which they have at the other sites so how long they will retain the routes in the routing table will be based on the graceful restart timer value which you are going to set by default if you see it's 43200 seconds which is 12 hours let me show you if you see it's by default 12 hours what we can do here is let's do this why not let's change it to be one hour okay again this value is purely dependent on the customer it's mostly based on their complaints or how long they want to retain a site when the control connections goes down so those things uh, will define this and uh, in the theory section i have told you about uh, how many prefix should be advertised uh, and uh, what's the ecmp limit i'm going to change it to be the maximum 16. if you see here if i make it 17 it's showing the maximum allowed is 16 only so i'll keep it to be the maximum so this template is going to get attached to the edges when we change this right we should change this in the vSmart as well. We should take care there. Okay. So in her lab as well, we should go back to the vSmart and change this value manually there. Let us, um, I'll not do this shutdown. That's not needed. We'll not shut down OMP at any case as I know. Timers, I'm going to leave that to be the default. And then these things will come back when needed. Yep, I think we are good here. Let's save. 
next uh, add template 8000 Cisco security let's give it a name Cisco security Reiki timer so by default the thumb rule is the Reiki timer should be at least twice the graceful restart timer so if you see here we had the graceful restart timer as one hour right we reconfigured that so the Reiki timer should be at least two hours it should not be less than that okay that's the Cisco recommendation we'll go ahead with two hours only so we change this global 7200 I'm keeping this as global so that it gets pushed to all the routers to whom this template is getting attached and the authentication type I'm going to leave it to be the default and keychain those details as well so let's save next one add template search 8000 again select this if I go down we'll see Cisco banner let's do that quickly yeah. so let's name it to be Cisco banner change it to be the global variable save and then keep adding 8000 v say just one minute if you see right in case if you have multiple types of CHS, say example if you have an isr as well right you can select that too right you can select two uh, edge routers at the same time and then create a template for that even if you don't do this now, you can add it later as well. So let's quickly move to creating the VPN templates now. So this is going to be Cisco VPN 0. And then the VPN number is 0. I'm going to give that a name as transport. Right. And if you need DNS, you can add here. But in my case, I need a host mapping because if you remember, we have given FQDN for our VBound always in our design and then resolved it to an IP address. So it's going to be lab.vbound.com and then the IP will be v192.168.0.52. Add it. Go down. Under IP route, if you remember, we do have two WAN transports. So I'm going to add two default static routes pointing to the next stops of each of the ISPs, which is the MPLS1 and the Internet1. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to make it an optional row. Let me do this and first say so I'll change this key value so that uh, when it prompts you, right, it will prompt you with this key value. So even uh, you will be able to understand that easily. I'm going to add as prefix one. Let me copy this. Now select it as optional so that even if you don't fill a value for this variable, it's going to allow you to push the configuration to the edge router. So that's the optional keyword. And then let's add an extra to this add next stop and then the next stop is I scroll down vpn0 next stop for prefix 1 okay and add let's add again this is one prefix and I am expecting a maximum of two prefixes in vpn0 so i'm going to add one more this one will be this one will be vpn0 ipv4 ip prefix 2 
and then it's going to be optional as well next stop vpn0 prefix2 add add and uh, nothing else for now let's save this then let's quickly do this let's quickly create vpn templates for vpn 10 and 20 as well so let's select the 8000 let's again click the same cisco vpn template here let's name it as cisco vpn 10 go down the vpn id is going to be 10 in this case name of this vpn will be data vpn that's our plan right and then go down we don't need a host mapping here host mapping is needed in vpn 0 only yes ipv4 route if you think in our lab design we are not going to add any static routes in vpn 10 at all we will be having ospf running on the vpn 10 lan side of the data center and then on the branches it's actually directly connected so we don't need ipv4 route in any of the cases so i'm going to skip that as well and just keep going yes save add template 8000 cat 8 kb and uh, click this again now for vpn 20 let's name this as cisco vpn 20 copy paste you can give the description uh, in a more granular way i'm just keeping it simple okay and the name in my case is voice vpn going down i don't need a dns entry and uh, here as well right if you think in data center we are going to run uh, brrp and it's a directly connected thing in the data center as well as in the branches if i go down i don't think i need anything else let's just say this as we discussed we have to create a template for mpls interface uh, internet interface and also the parent interface and tlock extension interface as well as i already told you don't get uh, too much stressed with this number of templates we are creating it's going to be one time effort let's click cisco vpn interface template i'm going to name this as i'll show you the easy ways as well right uh, i'll take copies and then i can reuse the templates just edit and reuse right mm, cisco vpn0 mpls interface and then if i go down i need option to turn off and turn on the link so i'm gonna keep do shutdown as device specific and then let me copy this and the interface name also may change in some case but in case if you are pro doing this in your production right it's preferred that uh, say you keep the same interface number throughout so that you can reduce the number of templates and you can you can make it global right to keep it simple and you can restrict your uh, operations team from doing any mistake or uh, changing the interface from your initial plan and then the ip address it's going to be a definite device specific one vpn0 mpls ipv4 and if i go down yes yes it is a tunnel interface let's turn that on you will see new options popping up yes and the color i'm gonna set it to be we decided it to be MPLS, right? And uh, restrict. What restrict does is uh, it will create tunnels only between the similar colors. Say, example, if I have MPLS and there is one more color called private one, right? So 
endpoints will form tunnel only between MPLS to MPLS and private one to private one. It will not form tunnels from MPLS to private one. Okay. But by default, if you don't do this, it will try to form even though he doesn't have reachability. That's the default behavior of Cisco sd -Man. And uh, maximum control connections. This is a catch here. If you remember our topology, in MPLS, I don't have connectivity to the controllers at all. So the thumb rule of Cisco sd -Man is only when you have control connections up via a specific T-Log, you go ahead and bring up BFD via the T-Log. To overwrite that thumb rule, we have to instruct the router that don't expect control connections here so that the router even though he is not able to form control connection he will go ahead and form the bft if i don't do this the mpls interface in our lab topology will always wait for the control connections to come up and obviously it will never able to establish control connection and then finally it will not bring up the bft as well so I have made it zero. Let's keep going here. Port hop on and yep. service. I think we'll leave it to be default. Say example, in case if you are uh, bringing BGP with your ISP, then you should turn this on. Then only the BGP neighborship will come up. So in our case, I'm going to leave that as default. And then under advanced option, I'm not going to do anything for now. Right? You see here the hello interval and hello tolerance are also available. In case if you want, you can tweak that as well. And NAT, NAT cannot be enabled on private colors, obviously. And uh, if I go down, I'm not going to do anything else. I'm going to save this. That's it. The next step is, let me take a copy of this MPLS. Rather than creating a separate new internet interface template, I'll just take a copy and then just quickly edit this because most of the values are going to be same. copy and uh, let me search for in here you go this is it let me edit this a bit right there the name doesn't seem proper let me rename it as internet so that uh, we read that properly right okay go ahead go down you see all i have to do is just change this keyboard from MPLS to internet and copy this interface name is going to be device specific okay this is typo there hold on internet IP address, I'm just going to keep. Go down, here you go. So it's a tunnel interface, but the color is public internet as we decided. Restrict is going to be on. Control connection, I'm setting it as default because we expect control connections to be up via the internet and then if i go down i think i don't need anything else yes i think we don't need anything we'll just go ahead update now uh, we have to do tlock extension as well in the data center let's create templates for that as well let's name this as cisco VPN0 TLOC ext interface. I think we need only one interface. We can reuse the same template for both the routers. That should be okay. So let's name this as VPN0 
tlock extension interface right let me copy this interface name description let's give him a description as well and then uh, ipv4 address is needed as well go down it's not a tunnel interface remember it's a tlock extension interface okay so it's not a tunnel interface obviously let's keep going let's go to the advanced section and then here you see right tlock extension this is where we have to tell him which interface he is going to extend right so we'll keep it as We'll keep it as device specific so that we can define it when we push it to the edge router that's it let's save and the tlock interfaces are planned to be sub interface so there should be obviously a parent interface for those sub interfaces so we need to create a parent interface template cisco vpn0 parent um, in okay one more catch here the parent interfaces will always be under vpn 0 right say example if you have gigabit 1 and uh, you segregate it uh, as gigabit 1.100 and uh, 1.200 and you assign 1.100 to the van side and uh, 1.200 to the LAN side, still the gigabit 1 interface should be configured under VPN 0. Okay. VPN 0 parent interface. Let's just keep it simple. Interface name. All we have to do with the parent interface is just unshared that. Right. If you remember, when you are creating sub interface, we don't generally configure IP address under the parent interface. Right. So I'm going to leave this as default. Only I'm having option to turn on that interface and a name and a description. That's all. I think we are good for this template. Let's save that. Ha. Huh. Okay. That's my bad. There is an important factor which I missed. Let me go back to that parent template the MTU if you remember I already told you that uh, the MTU of the parent interface should be at least four bytes more than the sub interfaces so if you remember uh, I haven't tweaked the MTU on the other templates which I created which I'm going to use for the tunnel interfaces right so my plan is increase the parent interface to 1504 so that i can leave the sub interfaces in 1500 next one we have the lan interfaces let's start off with the vpn 10 lan interface same template let's name this as cisco vpn 10 lan int 1 copy paste go down i'm gonna do this as device specific vpn 10 lan inf that should do interface name a description and it will have an interface ip as well and going down I don't think we need anything else so we can just save this and then what I'm gonna do here is let's search for this VPN 10 LAN interface which we created and take a copy we'll use this for VPN 20 this is how you can save some time uh, by taking copies and just quickly editing it Let's edit this. Yep, name is good. I just have to edit the keys. The keys should be saying VPN 20 rather than VPN 10. Let's change everywhere.
that's it let's update and then i'm going to take one more copy this is needed uh, for the brrp template okay so vpn 20 lan interface one say example with brrp copy paste copy let's edit this now and go under this section new vrrp group id i am going to set that to be 10 and uh, priority i am going to keep it as device specific so that you can uh, use the same template to both the routers and set a different priority sorry it's vpn 20 right vpn 20 vrrp priority timers let it be default and uh, there is options to track omp prefix list right we are going to keep it simple by uh, tracking the omp so when the omp goes down the vrrp will be down as well and uh, this is the ip address vrrp beep right virtual ip 20 you don't need anything else object tracker we are not going to do those things at least for now yes we are good let me add this update the next thing is if you remember i told you that the voice phones are going to get ip address from dhcp right we are not going to configure them static ip so we have to create a dhcp template as well let's select this search for dhcp here we go cf dhcp dhcp always remember this one template can be reused multiple times address pool i'm going to keep it uh, device specific no let's not do exclude address and all let's just have a address pool and then i don't need any options gateway interface mtu domain name yes I need a DHCP. I need a default gateway to be sent, right? And DNS servers. I don't need these things anyway. We are going to just validate with pings. We are good here. If you need, you can definitely use these options. But just for my lab, I don't think uh, I need those things. Let's click Add Template. The next one is OSPF. So we are planning to enable OSPF on VPN 10 in data center, isn't it? We'll do a OSPF template as well for that. Cisco OSPF. Cisco OSPF. Yeah. Router ID. I'm not going to do any router ID and all. If in case you need, you can do that. And uh, in OSPF, we will redistribute our OMP. Say if you think in the data center, we are going to have OSPF on the LAN and OMP is the protocol which is on the WAN side, isn't it? So we have to redistribute the routes from OMP into the OSPF and we also do in the other direction. So now I am inside OSPF, which is similar to an, um, being under router OSPF 10 or router OSPF 1, whatever it is, right? And then doing redistribute OMP. That's what I'm trying to do with the template. So just redistribute and add. Yeah. Yeah. New area. Let's keep it to be zero and uh, i don't need any type for that area let it be the default one and uh, interface ospf let's make it a little bit understandable ospf interface name and uh, hello interval i don't need to tweak this interface cost uh, let me think for a minute do i need the cost or no yeah i think i need the cost because uh, 
from the core switch perspective in the data center i may have to make sure that i am choosing the primary router right so for that i think i need the cost let me do that as well and if i go down advanced option let's do this let me change it to be point to point so that it comes up quickly i don't need authentication i don't want to complicate this so yep in data center router one there is only one interface with, where we need to enable ospf so i think uh, we are good here let's save this and it's going to come up an area zero this should be fine and uh, I think I have one gig as well. So the maximum I have is one gig. Let's keep it 10,000, 10 gig. Do I need to originate a default route? No, that's not my requirement. I think pretty much that's it. Let's, let's do this as well. Why should we leave this OSPF route already? Save. Yeah, we are good. We have created almost all the templates which are necessary to bring up the data center ST1 routers. We'll see if in case we have missed something and we identify when we bring up the edge routers, uh, we'll uh, come back and create them. And uh, if you remember, when we created the OMP template, I have changed the advertise and uh, ECMP limit to be 60 in the maximum. That time I have told you that we should do the change in vSmart as well. So let's quickly close that. Let's go to vSmart. We have to get into OMP. Send path limit you see by default it's 4 and it can be between 1 to 16 I'm gonna set it to be 16 and also I'm gonna add send backup path as well commit and commit. we are good here now let's quickly prepare basic configuration file for data center router 2 we are going to bring up data center router 2 first because if you remember we have the controller sitting only in the internet and the data center router 2 is the one who actually have internet connection directly right whereas data center router 1 have internet connection but it is actually via the data center router 2 it's a t lock extended link which the data center router 1 have right so we should bring up data center router 2 first here is the basic configuration template which i have already created for the data center router 2 config transaction is the command equivalent to config t in cisco st1 host name username and we are also setting the clock time zone the system ip which i have decided is 1011 for dc router 1 and 102 for this dc router 2 and for data center the site id which i have decided is 100 org name is going to be this which we already know vbondlab.vbond.com and the next stop is 20111 1.1 if you look at the diagram and who's the vbond 192.168.0.52 and gigabit 2 is the one which is connecting to the internet isn't it his ip is the same subnet dot 2 it's a slash 24 and uh, we are going to create a tunnel interface and use this interface as the source and the tunnel mode is sd1 and under sd1 we will uh, declare the color of this interface to be public internet and encapsulation as ipsec this is pretty much it this is the basic configuration which we need to bring up dc router 2 let's get into the dc router 2 quickly if you see dc router 2 is currently up but when i do a show version Type include mode. You see, hold on. Mode. You see, the operating mode of this router currently is autonomous. So, in latest versions of Cisco SD-WAN router, the router first comes up as a regular iOS router. 
and then we have to enable that router to be SD-WAN capable. How do we do that? We do controller mode enable. When I do this, the router will go for a reboot and then come up as SD-WAN enabled. One more thing we can do to validate quickly is show SD-WAN. If you see, this command doesn't work in normal mode. So let's get this enabled. No. Okay, the router went for a reboot. Let's wait for some time. Meanwhile, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable all other CAT 8KV routers in controller mode uh, DC router 1 and the branch 2 router. So let's do that. DC router 1 enable controller mode enable. let them come up as well branch router 2 yep controller mode enable so when we are in that section they will be ready for us just to save some time okay i'll pause here and then we'll come back when the router is up in controller mode Okay, I can see the router have rebooted and came back online. Let's try getting into the router. Yep, the default username password is admin admin and once you do that, uh, it will prompt you to set a new password. Admin admin and then I'm setting a new password. Yes, we are in the router now. Yeah. Okay, so do a show SD1. You see, now we are having this show SD1 command. Let's quickly do show version pipe include mode. You see, it's in controller mode. To onboard this router in Cisco SD1 overlay, the first thing is we need to install the enterprise root certificate. Because we are using enterprise EA model in our overlay, we need to install that manually. Otherwise, if we are using a Cisco or DigiCert or any other model, those root certificates are already pre-populated into the router. Before doing anything, let's uh, check this one quickly. Show SD1 control local properties. And you see the certificate status is not installed. Let me show you one more thing. Show SD1 certificate serial. Since this is a virtual router, we don't expect it to have a serial number also. This chassis number is a random built into the edge. We'll change this as well. Okay, let's start with installing the root certificate. If you see here, let me show you this. Show SD-WAN. Show SD-WAN certificate. Root certificate pipe include. I'm just trying to grab some specific lines from the output. It's a very big output, so we won't be able to see that completely. So I'm just trying to do this. When I do this, I don't see the truth certificate at all with this keyboard, right? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to install the truth certificate first. For that, I have already copied the truth certificate uh, into the boot flash of the router. You see here, I have the lab root certificate available in this router already what i'm going to do now is request platform software sd van certificate install no i think it's a sd van root search chain install and it is from boot flash the name is lab root cert enter yes the root certificate is successfully installed let's do the same command again 
you see now there is some lines which dictates that uh, the certificate is installed into the box the next step uh, let's get into the basic config copy paste it in not sure whether it got pasted successfully I think it just went into the config mode I haven't pasted anything let's do section by section just to be on the safer side yeah good commit commit there is issues why the host name haven't changed let's check that okay i think i missed to paste this host name thing let me do config transaction again go back to this template uh, i started copying from this i should have done this as well let me copy paste them in comment yes now we have the basic configuration pasted into the router and also we installed the root certificate which is the enterprise root certificate if you remember from our theory sections we need to generate a otp in the vmanage and provide it to the router so that the router will reach out to vbond and vmanage with that otp and then get a signed certificate from the vmanage allocated to him let's get back to the vmanage and let's get into devices now under the vantage list there is no vantages listed at all for this uh, there is uh, two options either we can sync with our smart account or we can upload the vantage list manually we are going to do the manual way now let's click this let me navigate to this file under SD WAN. I think I kept it here. Here you go. Right. Let me click this so that uh, it will share this data with the other controllers as well. Upload. Okay. You see, I, uh, there is six routers available, which is successfully installed here. Let's go back. Devices. Now we have the list. Let's click here on a 8KV. It can be anyone, and then click Generate Bootstrap Configuration. And here you have to select uh, Cloud in it. Keep it Cloud in it, and choose. and you see here there is a OTP and a UUID generated. OTP is the one time password which we are going to give to the router and this is the chassis number which the router is going to use once the router reaches to vmanage vmanage will assign him a serial number and a certificate let's copy this uuid first get back to the router before i paste this let's quickly validate the main thing which is reachability to the controllers 52 is vbond 51 is vmanage obviously everything is in the same subnet it should ping yep all are pinging so we can start this process request platform software sd wan vh cloud activate chassis number that's the uuid value which you copied from the vmanage gui and then now copy the otp and the keyword to give the OTP is token and then paste the OTP enter just give it some time so that first the VH reaches out to vbond and vmanage get a certificate and then turn down the connection freshly initiate new connections established with the controllers 
it should take some time let's give it some time you see there is already a log message stating that he reached up to the vmanage if in case you are in a console and whether it is hardware or virtual router and you are looking for a log message which will give you an identification that uh, the complete process is done right it's the omp come bring up message so the process goes like this the control connections forms to vbond first and then we manage and also to the vsmart once the control connections are good then the omp gets established so when you see omp up that gives you a clear idea that most of the things are ready right we can do a show st1 show st1 Let's go to the vManage. Here you see the current state is a certificate installed. So vManage have done his part. He have given him a certificate already. We can check the same in router as well. Show STVAN control local properties. You see a certificate is installed now. Let's quit and then this is what I was talking about. There is a vSmart OMP connection up. This gives us a clear idea that the router is ready. So let's quickly do a show control connections. You see, we have a vManage, vBond and vSmart. And uh, if you would have heard that uh, vBond is a temporary connection, yes, it's true, but it depends. Say, if we had one more vSmart in this network, then the vbond connection would have been bent down immediately after the vsmart came up since we have only one vsmart you will see always the vbond connection also up let's quickly check show st1 omp peers yes omp is also up now get back to vmanage and then under now here in the v manage right we should create a device template this is the template which will get attached to the edge router let's click from feature template and the model of the uh, router will be this one c 8000 b and uh, and the device route is sd1 edge template name i'm gonna keep it to be dcrt1 as a general practice i always keep the data center routers in a separate template whereas for the branches we'll use the same we'll try to use the same template as much as possible so let's create one template for the dc router oh okay it's dc router 2 now correct and then system the system template which we created Logging, we haven't done any logging and no NTP. Yes, we have created a AAA template. This is that, and we have a BFT of our own, and we also created a OMP template. Here it is, and also we created a security template. We are just look, I'm just calling the feature templates which I have created earlier, right? It's so simple. And then we are going to have a VPN0 and uh, there in vpn0 i am going to have one mpls let me search for that here it is mpls and then i have to add one internet as well plus there is a sub interfaces in edge router 2 so i need one parent interface and then if you remember we have to extend this internet leg from router 2 to router 1 for that i need a tlock extension interface so i'm going to select tlock extension interface 
and there is no routing protocols which I have, right? I have only static route which is called under this VPN 0 already. That should be enough. VPN 5.12, I'm going to leave it as default. In some cases, it asks you to create a template for VPN 5.12. I have seen that for some specific routers. I hope this should be fine if in case it's needed, we'll come back and create. Okay, now under VPN, we are going to add VPN. First, we are going to add VPN 10. Let's click next. Okay, I should move this to this side and click next. And in VPN 10, in the data center, I'm going to have one LAN interface. Let me search that. Here it is. And then I'm going to have OSPF enabled there. Right? Save and click Add VPN again. This is for VPN 20 now. Select that next and in VPN 20, I'm going to have only one interface and this time that interface is going to be a one with VRRP. Let's select and add. Let's keep going down. Cellular, additional templates. Yes, I have a banner which I'm going to use and uh, policy. Let's come back to this policy quickly. So. Just keep an eye on that. Let's create this. If you remember, we have discussed that we will create a localized policy where we will enable DPI and C flow, right? When we are talking about the templates creation for data center. Let's do that now. Let's go to config policy under localized policy, add policy. Skip all these for now. Let's go to the last page, enable NetFlow and application visibility. And I'm going to name this as localized policy. That's it. Simple for now. Save. Only when you do this, the router will start capturing the DPI statistics. Let's edit this again and go under this additional templates now here in policy if i click drop down you see that policy which we have created select that and update and we noticed from the router cli that uh, we are able to successfully establish the control connections isn't it same way in the gui if i go under network we should be seeing DC router 2 there as well, right? Now let's quickly move on to the templates and now I'm going to attach this router, the template. What configuration we have done so far in the router is just pure basic configuration. I just configured, I mean, informed about the internet interface of the router, right? Apart from that, the router doesn't have any other configuration. So when I attach the template, he's going to get details about the VPN 10, VPN 20, the T-Log interface, MPLS interface configuration also will only get pushed when I attach the template. I haven't done that in the basic configuration at all. So we must attach the template now. Attach device. You see DC router one pops up and attach. You see this gray mark. This should turn green. That's when you are allowed to move to the next page. So for that, we have to fill up the values for the variables, if you remember, which we done when we are creating the templates, right? So you see, this is how it asks you for filling up the values. First, it asks you for filling up uh, VPN 20 LAN interface name. What's your VPN 20 LAN interface? It's gigabit 6, right? Let me do one thing quickly. Let me pick this. name yes copy and vpn 20 as per our plan is gigabit 6 and uh, i'm going to keep the descriptions simple vpn 20 lan and the ip address as per our plan is 10.122 slash 24 and uh, yes 
the priority for router to let's make router one as primary so that uh, i'll keep this as 90 when we bring up router one i will give 110 there okay 110 ip address virtual ip for vrp is dot one as per our plan interface name for vpn 10 now i think it's gigabit uh, 5 description is vpn 10 lan ip address 10.1.1.1 slash 24 that's my plan and i have to enable ospf there isn't it so let me keep the router id same as the interface just to keep it simple and ospf interface name how to enable ospf on gigabit 5 and uh, let's keep the cost as 10 here we'll do the same on the second rotor we'll do 20 there right so that we'll prefer this and now in vpn 0 we have created two prefix lists right so i'm going to have two default routes in the vpn 0 one and two you see this is optional say if i remove this you see that even you can skip that that shows an optional keyword there right that that is what happens when you enable that optional tab uh, that i have showed you in uh, the template creation steps now the first next stop is to not uh, sorry 200 no my bad 201 11 and uh, 1.1 that's the internet next stop and the second next stop for VH router 2 in data center is the VH router 1 because MPLS link is extended from router 1 to router 2, right? So we, he should point a default route back to router 1. That's how it works. Now let me add this next stop. The next stop is 10, 10, 10, 1. If you see in our diagram, this is gigabit 3.100 interface. Followed by that VPN0 TLOC extension interface. Who is the one extending the TLOC which is internet TLOC from this router to the router 1. As per our plan gigabit 3.200 is the interface who is going to extend internet TLOC. And then VPN0 internet TLOC extension interface. And the IP address we have planned is 2011101 subnet mask slash 24 tlock extension. This is the point. Who are you going to extend? I'm going to extend gigabit 2. So gigabit 2 is the internet tlock interface. I'm extending that interface via gigabit 3.200. And then VPN parent interface yeah as i told you we have to create a parent interface for this gigabit you see gigabit 3 sub interface we have created now so for that we have to create a parent interface that parent interface is going to have just a description and a shutdown option that's it and then for vpn 0 internet name now this is for the internet interface let's do let me, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a uh, gigabit 2 description VPN 0 internet interface and the IP we have planned is 201.11.1.2 slash 24 VPN 0 MPLS interface in our design is 3.100 that's the tlock as per uh, vh router 2 but actually it's getting extended from router 1 but uh, vh router 2 is not aware about that he just believes that he have a direct connection to mpls copy paste just rename it as mpls ip address which we have planned is 10 10 10 2 slash 24 
and the host name for this box is dcrt2 location i'm going to give us system ip we have planned is 101102 if i'm not wrong site id 100 i'm not going to enable port hopping here yes i think this should be fine let's update you see now it's green what i'm going to do i'm just going to take a backup of this just in case if i want to refill this i don't need to type everything again so let's click next let's click here this will give us a configuration preview and also we can see the configuration difference between the configuration which we are going to push and the configuration which is already available in the box next if you see here this is the config preview this is the configuration which is going to get pushed into the box and we can also see a config diff side by side diff you see this is the current local configuration on the box and this is the new configuration since this is the first time i'm pushing configuration to this box via template you will see lots and lots of changes but in case if this is already pushed and you are doing some operational change you may see very few lines uh, difference between these two let's push this and before i do that you see this configure device rollback timer so when i push this uh, template if the control connections goes down within five minutes after five minutes to be exact uh, the vmanage will roll back to the last good known configuration right and then come up so let's configure let's give it a couple of minutes okay you see now the template is attached successfully to the router we can quickly go to configuration devices and then from here you can see that uh, if I scroll to the right the first router 10.1.1.2 have a template attached where it is yeah here assign the template dcrt2 that's the template name attached to that so this gives us a clear indication that which routers have templates assigned which are in CLI mode and all. Let's go back to templates. Okay, here if you see devices attached, when I click that, it shows that DC router 2 is attached to this. What we are going to do now is we brought up DC router 2 in a way that we first configure the CLI and then the router comes up and joins the vManage then we push the template instead we will first create a template and then attach it to a serial number followed by that we will go ahead and do the basic configurations needed on the DC router 1 so that when DC router 1 comes up and joins the overlay that is the vManage he already have a template ready for him to consume right so we will see how that model works now let's start creating a template for DC router 1 from feature template select model cat 8kb device model sd manage template name dcrt1 copy paste same system template you see I am using the same feature template for multiple device templates. This is the beauty of templates. AAA, BFD, OMP, now think from VH router 1 shoes, right? What are the things he have? He have a VPN 0 and he have one directly connected MPLS interface and then we also have a internet transport but it is extended from VH router 2 but obviously he is not aware about that so he believes that he have an internet transport as well and then he needs to extend his MPLS to this other router so for that he needs a TLOC extension interface and then since we have sub interfaces we need a parent interface as well that's all i think uh, we don't need any routing protocols obviously we are using static routing and uh, yes let's add vpn 10 first vpn 10 move 
next and we know that for uh, VPN 10 we need this uh, VPN 10 LAN interface and also a OSPF template let's add that let's add VPN 20 as well there we need only a VRRP template let's go ahead and check this add go down we don't need anything in cellular banner let's use the existing template policy let's use the same policy which we have already created that's it let's create this now even before the router comes up since this is a virtual router what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna attach and just attach any one of the available serial numbers maybe this now we have to fill up the values edit template yes so what's the vpn 20 lan interface gigabit 6 is the vpn 20 lan interface in this router as well description vpn 20 and uh, his ip is dot 3 and this guy's priority is going to be 110 because he's dc router 1 20.1 is the vrrp ip and vpn 10 lan interface is gigabit 5 vpn 10 lan ip address is i think it's 10.1.1.2.1 and then router id for the ospf i'm going to keep it as the interface ip and uh, I'm going to enable OSPF on gigabit 5. Interface cost, I'm going to keep it 20. And as we already discussed, we need two default roads. One pointing to the directly connected next stop, which is MPLS in this case, which is 210.1.1. The second one is the TLOC extended next stop. That's 201.1. 11 10 1 i think so vpn 10 parent interface is gigabit 3 this guy also has sub interfaces right so we need to create parent interface and uh, he is also going to extend his uh, mpls tlock to router 2 so he is going to extend it via gigabit 3.100 description vpn 0 MPLS TLOC extension and the IP which we have planned for 3.100 is it's 10 10 10 1 slash 24 and uh, he is going to extend gigabit 1 that's the MPLS interface in router 1 and who's the internet interface in this case internet interface is going to be 3.100 200 so router one believes that he have a direct connection to the internet transport via 3.200 and we can see internet interface and the ip address we plan for that is 201.11 i think it's 10.2 24 and then mpls is obviously gigabit one description let it be mpls interface and the IP which we have planned is 210.1.2 slash 24. That's the local IP. Host name for this router is DCRT1. Location same. System IP. This is 1.1 .1 as we planned. Site ID 100. Let's update. Let's download this for a safer side. And click next. And if you see here, we, do, we will not see any config diff because uh, obviously the router still haven't came up in the overlay. See, only the local configuration from vManage is available. Let's push this. The vManage will tell in a bit that uh, the router is offline and will push the configuration when the router comes online. You see, it's done, scheduled. 
and if I go under configuration devices and this particular second line item if I go to this side he is sync bending and the, the device is offline so he is waiting for the device to come up let's bring up that router first let's start with the basic configuration preparation and uh, I have already created a template so it's one not one isn't it and same as we done for uh, router 2 but there will be a little difference I'll show you this is the same and the next stop in this case is going to be 2.1.11.10.1 we are going to use the tlock extension interface to bring up this router because as I told you internet is the only path where controllers are available 192.168.0.52 and you see we are going to use gigabit 3.200 on this router so for that I also have given the parent interface in the CLI mode and uh, the IP for this router is dot two. Yes, tunnel interface. I think everything else is good. We are ready with this. And if you remember, we have reloaded the router uh, a bit ago. Let's go back to the router and see his status. DC router one. Okay, there he is. Let's get into the router. Yes. Now he should be in controller mode. Let's quickly validate and move forward. Show version type include mode. Yeah, you see he's in controller mode. Right? And also you should be able to do show SD1 related commands. Now first step, let's install the root certificate which we have in the boot flash. This root certificate I have copied before starting this lab. Uh, you see it's there I'm going to install that first request platform software root search software SD van root search chain install boot flash this is the one the root search chain is installed we can quickly validate that by show sd1 certificate root search chain pipe no it's a typo it should be network yes there it is let's copy the basic configuration which we have created go ahead Config transaction. Okay, commit. There is some issues. Interface three dot hundred. IP address value 2.1.11.10.2 configuring IP routing in the sub interface. Okay, I hope uh, you would have understood the issue by now. I think it's uh, the encapsulation command which I'm missing. Let's get back into the interface gigabit 3200 i think i'm missing this particular thing not sure interface gigabit 3.200 encapsulation top 1q200 Let's commit now. There is again some issues. Hold on. So let's get into interface gigabit three. I hope I should do MTU 
1504. Let's commit. Have it taken the config? Yes, it does. So let me get back to this configuration file. I'll show you what are the things I changed. I have added this command extra, which is emtu1504. And also, I missed one important basic command encapsulation dot 1q200 here. OK, I have saved the file. I'll see if I can share these files in the description box. But I suggest you to do it on your own. But it will be there in the description box uh, in case uh, if you need that. OK, let's go back here. Now, what do you think? The router should start forming the control connections. If your answer is no, you're right. It should not start form control connection because he still don't have a certificate, right? And also he doesn't have a serial number. So show SD WAN certificate serial. If you see, he doesn't have a serial number, and this chassis number is just a temporary chassis number. What should we do? We should go to the vManage and generate a OTP and share it to him. Let's get to the vManage. The second line item, this is where the template is currently attached. So we'll use that one to generate the OTP. Generate bootstrap. Okay. If we go down, this is the UUID. Let me copy that and remember the command. Request platform software. SD WAN VH Cloud activate chassis number is this, and then the token is gonna be this one. Okay, we have accepted this. So now we expect this router to establish control connections. Let's quickly do this if he is able to ping 192.168.0.52. He is not able to ping. Not sure why. Let's see. I think there is some issue in the underlay. Let's first ping the next stop. Yes, I'm able to ping the next stop. Do I have a show IP route? Two not one eleven ten one. Yes, I have a static route pointing to that. Okay, you know what? I know the issue. Let me tell you what is the issue. This subnet. The 2.11.10.0 slash 24 subnet is available between router 1 and router 2. Now think about the internet router's perspective, right? He doesn't know that subnet at all. I actually haven't created a route pointing back to DC router 2. So the INET 1 cloud should point back a route for this slash 24 with the next stop as DC router 2 so that any traffic destined to this IP should be sent via the data center router 2. Let's do that. Get into INET1. Show, show IP interface brief. Load on the side. And uh, yeah, the first one. So IP route two not one eleven ten zero two five five two five five two five five zero. The next stop is two. Let's see whether this fixes this issue. Let's go back here. Yeah, you see, the moment I added that route, he is able to authenticate with the VMAN successfully. 
there is one more general practice which is uh, always followed in this kind of design is uh, instead of having a public ip for that uh, tlock extension link we could have add a private ip and then enabled nat on the gigabit 2 interface which is the internet tlock interface on uh, router 2 right so that when the traffic goes out of that uh, router it will get natted so you don't need to add a static route and also you don't need to buy a extra uh, public ip right that's a preferred method but uh, since this is my lab i have my own choice right so i used extra public ips but just know that that option is also available let's quickly so as i told you already we'll wait for the omp's uh, logs and uh, let's quickly check uh, control connections if we can see something already yeah it's trying to connect let's give it some time we should see the omp logs coming up and we expect this router to go ahead and fetch the template automatically from the vmanage let's see i am in the network page of the vmanage if you see the router is currently unreachable so as i told you the router first comes up and then goes down so we should give it some time it should come back up again you see it's almost reachable that's a that's a success uh, you should see it reachable and then unreachable and then it should come back uh, up as reachable after that it will not go down so you should see it uh, unreachable only one time during the onboarding process if it stays in unreachable then there is a big issue i mean the router haven't onboarded properly so you have to check it further let's see from router's perspective now yep you see omp pair came up let's quickly do sd wan control connections huh you see there is some init backup vrrp messages how did this router know about the vrrp configuration so that's an indication that he picked the configuration from the template already let's see let's give it a minute i have given the router ample amount of time so let's check show sd1 control connections actually should have been connections yeah control connections are fine and then let's check the show sd1 omp peers my bad peers here you go omp is up as well now if i do a show ip interface brief show interface brief you see i have received configuration about everything the mpls interface the internet interface and also i should have received configurations for the lan interfaces and if i do show vrrp show ip vrrp i think that's the command show vrrp yeah show vrrp brief you see i have received almost all the configurations the ospf configuration should also be there but uh, remember we haven't configured the core switch yet so we don't expect it to come up but at least the configuration is ready let's get to the v manage and you see this uh, router is up and uh, if i go to the templates now you see dc router 1 came up and also he consumed this template successfully that concludes the onboarding of both sd1 routers in the data center we have brought them up successfully let's move forward and quickly configure the lan side as well here in the dc switch we'll start configuring the interfaces connecting to the vpn 10 first let's go ahead and ethernet 2 slash 1 IP address 10.1.1.2255 I think it's slash 24 here and then no shutdown let's go ahead and do the same for 2 slash 2 that's connect to the second router IP address 2.2 no shutdown and Let's just ping the next stops and validate this first. Yes, uh, no.
you know what i just validated the data and identified that uh, say uh, in dc router 1 it should have been 10 1 1 subnet and on the second link connecting to vpn 20 it should have been 10 1 22 instead i swapped the lan interface ips between dc router 1 and dc router 2 from my initial plan so i should change this back so that uh, this router should be able to ping that's why it's not able to ping currently let me correct this ip issue first Okay, I have corrected the configuration. Let's get back into the DC switch and then check this ping again. Okay, I'm able to ping now. Same way, let's ping the second router. Post 2.1. Yes, I'm able to ping that as well. Okay, let's go ahead and configure the DC server connecting interface, which is... Uh, interface ethernet 2 slash 11 and uh, i is going to be a switch port switch port mode access switch port access vlan 10 and uh, i think i haven't configured vlan set name vlan 10 vlan 20 Let's just give the name as VLAN 20. I'm not able to think of a better name, so let's keep it simple. And then we are going to create a SVI here for uh, VLAN 10. The VLAN 10 gateway will be the core switch. And then from the core switch, there will be OSPF running, uh, which will carry the traffic up to the uh, DC router 1 and 2. So let's configure this. The IP is 10 1 10 1 slash 24. No shutdown. Now let's get into the DC server and then we'll validate whether we are able to ping up to this gateway first. Here I am in the DC server. Let's ping the gateway 10 1 10 1. Okay, what happened? Yes, Ethernet 2 slash 11, no shut. I'm not able to ping the gateway. Let me just quickly check this. Okay, the VLAN 10 interface is down. I think I haven't uh, issued a no shutdown. No shut. Yes, here you go. I'm able to ping to the gateway. Let's just clear the OSPF now between this uh, core switch and the edge routers, DC SD1 edge routers. Maybe let's okay. Let's put OSPF process as 10. Process ID doesn't matter really. And then I'm not gonna give any router. Let's give a router ID. Why not? Let's give same thing. And then auto cost reference bandwidth if you remember i have set the band reference bandwidth as 10000 mbps there so i should match it here as well and then followed by that uh, what we are going to do is if you see here from this dc switch we are able to ping 100.100.100 uh, that's a internet destination which i have created in the internet servers router which i have showed you earlier in the gns3 so i'm able to ping that to reach this i have actually created a default route here if you see there is a default route 
what I'm going to do, I'm going to get back into this OSPF and then default information originate. I'm not going to give always. Since we have a default route, it should be enough. It will take that default route and get it advertised. Then we'll get into the Ethernet 2 slash 1 IPOSPF. Uh, router no IP router OSPF process 10 and it's gonna be in area 0 and also IP OSPF network is gonna be point to point if you remember from our earlier configuration in the SD1 edge routers and also we have to do IP OSPF cost for this link this is the primary link connecting to the uh, router one so i'm going to give it a cost of 10. let's get into the ethernet 2 slash 2 this is a secondary link connecting to second router let's do the same thing ip router ospf 10 and area is 0 IP OSPF, OSPF network point to point and IP OSPF cost I think I have given it 20 let's see if the OSPF came up here IP OSPF interface brief yes OSPF is enabled yes neighbor is also there show OSPF neighbors you see both neighbors are full let's go to DC router 1 and then here in DC router 1 if I get in admin and the new password let's show IP OSPF neighbors you see there is one neighbor and then if we do a show IP route VRF show IP route VRF VRF 10 that's VPN 10 you see I have already received the OSPF route which is the default route originated by the DC switch same thing let's do in DC router 2 admin admin at 1 to 3 enable show IP route VRF 10 Yes, I have that. Obviously, the neighborship should also be there. Yes, neighborship is also there. So, from the core switch, we are receiving the default route. And uh, if you remember, while creating the templates, we have created policy so that, uh, hold on, I will show you. Show and section router OSPF. Yes, we have created template so that OMP is redistributed into OSPF, but uh, we haven't created policy so that uh, OSPF will be redistributed into OMP that we haven't done. Let's complete that here itself. Let's go to config templates and let's go into the OMP template or we'll go into VPN 10. And here in advertise OMP, what we are going to advertise into OMP from VPN 10 is, let's click new advertise OMP. Yeah, here it is. I'm going to take OSPF and get it advertised. Let's add remember this template is going to get attached to the branch also where we don't have ospf at all but uh, that will not have any effect in case if you are doing this in production it's advisable to have a separate template update and when we do changes in the feature template it will be reflected to all the device templates to which the feature template is attached so let's click next let's see what's the config getting changed we should see that uh, OSPF is redistributed into OMP. That's the missing piece, right? 
let's see the config diff click config diff side by side diff let's see where is the change okay here is the change if you see under omp section we are uh, advertising the ospf external but specific to vr of 10 okay let's push this configuration so the configuration is getting pushed to both routers let's just give it a minute okay here you go config is changed in both the routers so whatever it's receiving in ospf it is going to redistribute back into omp as well so we have achieved mutual redistribution in dc router 1 and dc router 2 if we bring up any other branches with vpn 10 this default route should be advertised now we'll see that when we bring up branch 2 and branch 1 for now let's move forward and do the vpn 20 related configurations in dc switch for uh, vpn 20 dc switch is going to just act as a transparent uh, l2 switch right for that i need to configure interface ethernet 2 slash 12 and uh, ethernet uh, 2 slash 3 ethernet 2 slash 4 all these interfaces 2 slash 12 is connecting to voice phone 2 slash 3 is connecting to dc router 1 and 2 slash 4 to dc router 2 everyone will be switch port switch port mode access and switch port access 20 switch port access vlan 20 no shirt and uh, let's quickly do this show vlan yes vlan 20 is allowed in all these three interfaces and let's open dc phone now let's get into the dc phone and see whether he got a ip from dhcp mm, he haven't got any ip yet you know what we haven't configured dhcp on the router itself And then if I even if I do show run DHCP, yep, we don't see any DHCP config at all. Let's click on DC router one edit uh, edit and then let's go under VPN twenty. Let's click edit and uh, we'll add a sub template for this interface which is going to be a dhcp template save update now it's going to prompt us to fill up the dhcp values let me click edit and here it's 10 120 0 slash 24 10 121 that's the gateway let's update next let's configure let's wait for this to get pushed okay the config is pushed let's get back to dc phone if you see he got an ip from the dhcp server running in dc router one uh, i'll leave the dhcp server only on the router one if you know i have assigned a slash 24 already there in the dhcp lease it's not advisable to have two DHCP servers servicing the same LAN. It will create clash. So we'll keep it simple by having it only on the router one. Let me quickly check this. Yep, it got assigned uh, dot four. Or I will do now is I will just quickly validate twenty dot one reachability, and also we'll validate. Uh, 20.2 that is router 1 here you go and 20.3 that's router 2 yep we are able to ping everything 
let me get into DC router one. If you see DC router one, I have logged into that from the vManage CLI. From here, if I do show VRRP, this is for gigabit six, which is VPN 20 interface. He is the master. Same way, if I get into second router from here, so VRRP, he is the backup router, right? That concludes our VPN 20 configuration for data center. We have completely brought up the data center now. I don't see any configuration spending for the data center side. We'll go ahead and configure the rest of the sites now. Now let's start with branch two. We'll bring up the SD1 router as well as the LAN components. In branch two, the router model is CAT AKV, similar to our data center. So there is no need for us to recreate most of the templates which we already created. First system template, there is an existing one, AAA existing, BFD is already available, security available, OMP available, banner available, policy available, VPN 0, MPLS interface, internet. So I keep going. Yep, almost everything is already available, right? We are going to reuse those feature templates to build our device template for BR2 or T1 router. Let's keep going here. Now to bring up this uh, branch 2 router, we don't really need to create any new feature templates. We'll try to reuse whatever we created for the data center. Let's click here and then the model of router will be cat8kv there in branch 2 and it's an edge template name i'm going to keep a common template name say uh, a site with uh, one mpls one mpls one internet let me name this like this and also let me name it as one router one mpls and one internet VPN 10 and 20. If you see, I'm giving a descriptive name based on the design of the site so that uh, if there is another site coming up with the same design as our branch 2, we can simply reuse this template which we have created. We'll attach that router as well to the same template. Let's move on. System. Let me call the system template which we already created. AAA. We created already BFT, same BFT, OMP, let us select the OMP which we created and security, this is the one which we created. Now for the transport VPN, if you see branch 2, we need VPN 0 with uh, 1 MPLS and then we need uh, 1 internet link template. Apart from that, we don't need a parent interface or uh, a TLOC interface template there. We don't really have a sub interface or we are not going to do TLOC extension also. So we don't need them. We can quickly move forward. There we need both VPNs. So to start off, let's select VPN 10, move it next. In this side, we are just going to have a LAN interface in VPN 10 and uh, the user machine there is directly connected so we don't need any protocols or dhcp anything let's add again vpn 20 now and next interface now vpn 20 we'll select the normal vpn 20 interface without vrrp that should be enough since we have only one router and then we need a dhcp there Let's select DHCP and uh, if we keep going, we'll select banner and we'll use the policy which we already created. I think that's it. Let's create this template. Now if you see here the template is ready. 
I'm going to attach this to any one CSR device which we already have. Let me select the first one. Attach. Edit. Yes. VPN 20 LAN interface is going to be gigabit 6 there. Description will have the same description. IP address the one we planned there is it's uh, I think it's 20 10, 3, 20. that's the IP which we have planned and uh, we are going to use the complete pool there as well and then default gateway is going to be this one obviously VPN 10 LAN interface is gigabit 5 description and and the LAN interface IP will be 10 3 10 going down further on the WAN side we are going to have two default routes one pointing to 210 3.1 that's the MPLS next stop another one is 201113.1 that's the internet next stop and uh, vpn0 internet interface name here is gigabit2 description ip address is this one and for mpls it's gigabit1 and i description IP will be similar to this 210 3 2 slash 24 and then moving on the host name for this device is BR2 RT1 location is let's keep the same thing yes the plan I think which I have is 103 Site ID 300 and we will enable port hopping. This is a branch, so we will enable port hopping, whereas we will not do that for the hub sites. Okay, let's click next. Let me go back a minute. Let me just download this for a safer sign. Let's click next. Let's push this configuration. So it should say that uh, once the device comes up, I will push the config. Let's see. Okay, here you go. It's done scheduled. Let's start to bring up this branch now. Let me get into this branch router. If you see, we already have enabled controller mode in this box. And this box is available in controller mode, isn't it? Yes, it is. And also, I already copied the copied uh, the root certificate to this box. So let's start creating the basic configuration file now. Here you go, the basic configuration template which I have created for branch two router, host name, username, clock, and the system IP. I think I have given one not three when I'm filling the template, isn't it? We'll go back and change that. I have planned it to be 104. We'll change it uh, in a minute. And site ID also should be changed to be 1002. We'll change it. And uh, lab. And uh, the next stop, we are going to bring this up via internet. So. I'll give the internet next stop and the VBond will be 192.168.0.52 uh, is the VBond in our network and uh, the local interface IP is dot two. Yes. Apart from that, everything looks good. Before I paste this config, let me go to the GUI and get back to the template and change the system IP and uh, site ID as per our plan sorry I should go to change values change device values next edit let's go down 
okay it should be 104 and 1002 that was my plan so we'll just stick to the initial plan which i prepared so that's why i'm changing this okay that should be good so we'll go back yes the config is ready let me copy this config get into the router config transaction paste the config which i have prepared let's just quickly validate whether all the configs have been taken successfully yes it is let me and let's save this the next step should be installing the root certificate which we have right we still haven't done that before i do let me quickly show you show sdvan certificate root certificate might include if we search for our root certificate we should not see that so and also if you see show sdvan control local properties we see here it doesn't have the certificate installed yet obviously it still haven't got the root certificate itself the enterprise root certificate what we are going to do now is we are going to install the root certificate which we have request platform software sdvan root certificate chain install install it from the boot flash and this is the file Here we go. The root search chain is installed successfully. Now for the CH device to get onboarded into the overlay, he still needs a OTP so that he can reach out to the vManage and get a serial number and certificate itself. So let's do that. Let's go to the vManage, configure device. This is the value to which we have attached the template. So we'll generate the bootstrap there. Let's click OK. This is the chassis number. Let's copy that first. Go to the CLI. Request platform software SDVAN. SDVAN VH cloud activate chassis number the chassis number which I just copied and the token which is the OTP let me copy that as well enter we actually haven't validated a ping to the vbond maybe we can do that or you should see some log which will indicate us that he is able to reach in first place yes he is able to ping that should be fine Let's just give it a minute. Let's see if he's coming up. Yes, you see, he's trying to authenticate to the vManage, which is a good sign. As I told you already, we should see the OMP coming up. That's the indication the process has been completed. Also, let's see if from the network perspective. Yeah, in the network page. Here we go. You see branch router to already up and reachable. We may see it going down, but it should come back up eventually. Let's just give this some time. I'll hold and see. Okay, here we go. If you see this router, uh, I can notice OMP is up. So I'm seeing anyway, OMP up and let's check the control connections first. Yes, all control connections are intact as we expect it to be. Let's check the OMP peers. OMP is up as well. From vManage perspective, I am seeing branch 2 router 1 is up. Now if you notice, there is BFD is up as well. We will come back to that in a minute. Let's just quickly check whether the template have been successfully attached to this box now. See, there is one device attached to this template which is our branch to router one if i go back to this earlier when we brought up our data center we only validated the control connection that is because obviously we haven't brought up any other sites that time he's the first site to come up now since we have another site we should see the ip set tunnel the data plane tunnel should be up as well let's check that show sd1 bft 
sessions. Okay. Here, from branch to router's perspective, he have four tunnels. So first, he have two tunnels to data center router one via MPLS and also via internet. Both are up. Whereas when he wants to establish a data plane tunnel to the DC router two, he is able to establish only via public circuit. But uh, the MPLS is down. You know what? I think I know the reason. Let me show you why. If I ping this destination sourced from my MPLS interface, obviously I'm not able to ping. This is because if you remember when we brought up the TLOC extension interface of uh, internet circuit, right, uh, between the data center router one and router two, we added a static route in the internet cloud. Same way, we should have added a static route for the MPLS TLOC subnet in the MPLS cloud, which we haven't done. So let's go to the MPLS router and add this. So we should see this coming up once we add that. So if I show you, this is the interface connecting to the data center router one. So I should add a route. 10 10 10 0 i think that's the subnet let me validate one second yeah i just checked that that's the one so it's actually 255255250 and this should point to this let's see now now here in this branch 2 let's quickly check whether the bfd session came up or not yes you see we have that tunnel up now so it's up for last one so that's it we do have the tunnels also formed successfully that is the data plane tunnel i think we are good between these two sides we'll quickly validate the lan part of branch router 2 which is this these two interfaces right this is vpn 10 and this is vpn 20. let me bring up the vpn 10 and vpn 20 host First, to start off, I am in the branch 2 phone. If you see here, it actually got an IP. So the moment router got the template assigned from the vManage, he would have given the DHCP related configuration along with the template, right? So this phone also got an IP. Let me quickly ping. Also, let's quickly check the route table. He should have got a default route as well. Yes, he did. Let's ping the gateway. Yes, I'm able to ping. Let's quickly ping 1023. I think it's 10, 1, 20, 100. Um, if I remember right, I think it took four. Yes. Let me show you who's 10, 1, 24 if you forgot. That's the data center phone. 10, 1, 24. Okay, we are good with the voice phone over there in branch 2. Let's quickly get into the user machine. Here we go. This is the branch 2 PC. Let me first ping 10, 3, 10, 1. Who's the gateway? Yes, I'm able to ping. Now let's ping 10, 1, 10, 100. That's our data center server. You see, we are able to ping. But if I ping 10, 1, 24, which is the voice phone, I'm not able to ping. This is because this is not in the same VPN as the voice subnet, right? So we will not be able to ping between the data and voice. Let me show you 10, 1, 10, 100. You see, first hop is our local gateway and then we are reaching up to 10, 10, 10, 2. That is uh, the TLOC IP, I think, TLOC uh, extension MPLS interface. And then eventually we are reaching to the LAN interface. I think we are landing in the data center router too. So we haven't done any specific policy so that that's why it's choosing uh, based on the default mechanisms and it's reaching up to data center router 2 
finally it reached up to the actual server in the data center that concludes our branch to bring up we have validated both vpn 10 and vpn 20 from branch 2 all the way up to the data center let's start bringing up the other site now let us start to bring up the sd1 routers in branch 1 and follow that up by configuring all the LAN components as well. In branch 1, we do have a VH cloud router, so we will have to create a complete set of separate templates for the same. In vManage, there is always a separate templates created for CH and VH. Let's discuss about the feature templates that we have to create for BR1 RT1 router. As we done for the data center routers, we need to create a new system template. Why a new system template? Because this is completely separate. This is for VH router. And then a AAA, BFD, security, and OMP. Okay, one more thing. Even though it's a separate template and it's for VH, the parameters and concept remain same. Okay, it's just that we have to maintain two separate templates for VH and CH and then follow that up with the banner and uh, localized policy with the tpi c flow existing this is the catch this localized policy is not a template it's a separate policy so we can reuse the same policy which we have created for ch there is no segregation there in policies whether it is for ch or vh follow that up with uh, vpn0 and uh, mpls interface template internet interface vpn10 lan interface for VPN 10, VPN 20 and a LAN interface for VPN 20, DHCP. So in this case, except for the localized policy, we are going to create everything newly. Let's start. Okay, here I am in the branch 1 router 1. Let me bring up the basic configuration file. If you notice the difference, this router is VH cloud. It does run the Viptala OS. So the basic configuration, the CLI configuration will look different. This will be very equivalent to what we have done with the vManage, vBond and vSmart. Whereas for Cisco IOS XC SD-WAN routers, the configurations will be different. Let's start with the host name, which is branch1 RT1. Location and i have already planned the system ip and site id let it be org name clock and v bond data and the v bond ip is 192.168.0.52 we are going to use the internet interface to bring up and ip address is 201.11.2.2 I think so. Let me quickly validate this once. Yep, that's right. And uh, all other seems fine. And the next stop is dot one. Let me copy and get into this router. That's config T here. It's not config transaction in this router. Commit and commit and quit. If you try commit and quit option, I mean the commit and quit command in Cisco IOS XE SD1 routers, it will not work. Only commit will work there. You see, it took the config. As we done for the other routers, the next step is to install the enterprise root CA. Actually, I still haven't copied the enterprise root CA file to this router. I'm just going to pause this. I'll copy that file here and then we'll connect back. Okay, I just completed copying the file. Let me show you. You see, I just copied the file over here. Now let's go ahead and uh, install this uh, root certificate. Request root search chain install home admin. Yes, let's install this. Yes, it's successfully installed. So we have installed the root search chain and also we have done the basic configuration already. The next step is generate a OTP from vManage and share it with this router so that he can get the serial number and uh, certificate from the vManage. Followed by that, he will go ahead and establish a permanent TTLS tunnel with the controllers. Let's start this. 
here in the vManage, let's go to configuration devices and this time it's for a VH cloud, not for a CAT 8KV. So let me pick one and generate bootstrap configuration there. Okay. And we'll copy this UUID. Request. Before that, let's quickly ping 192.168.0.52. Yes, I'm able to reach. Now go ahead and request an VH cloud activate chasis number and token is this. Go ahead and paste the token. Let's give enter. Let's give it some time and wait for this to come up. Here you go, it's trying. If you see, it just initiated the connection with the vBond and vManage. We don't expect to see uh, vSmart now. This is the initial OTP based authentication. So once this is done and he get a um, certificate and serial number, later he will establish a permanent connection with vBond, vManage and the vSmart. Let's quickly go ahead and do show control local properties. Here you go. The certificate is already installed and if I do a show certificate serial, yes, I see a serial number as well. So he should come up properly. Let's validate. Yes, there is no control connections yet. So the initial control connections have been turned down. So they should come up now. If we get to the vManage monitor network. Now here you see branch router one is also there and he is reachable as well. Let's get back to the CLI and do the control connection again. Yes, the control connections are successfully established. Let's check OMPPS. Yes, there is a OMP session with the vSmart as well. Let us also quickly check BFD sessions. If you see here, we have BFD sessions with the uh, 11104, 11104, 101, 102, and 104. He have BFD sessions uh, with everyone via public internet. There is no connection via MPLS because still we haven't uh, configured the MPLS interface at all. We haven't created a template yet for this box, right? Once we do that and push the template, it should come up properly. So let us keep this here. Let's go ahead and create the templates and come back and validate these things under co configuration templates now the challenge here is uh, this is a vh box so we have to go ahead and create a new set of feature templates totally for this one so whatever we have created cannot be used for a vh we have to start all over again since i have already explained you the facts of uh, most of the templates which we have created we are going to anyway create similar templates for vh cloud all the options is going to be similar as well I'll suggest you to watch this if you think uh, it will help you or you can you even skip them. It's very similar to whatever we have done already.
okay we have the template now let's go ahead and attach this attach it to br1 rt1 attach now we must fill all the values vpn 20 lan is uh, g0 slash 3 the interface numbers of a VH router will look different if I go to this VH router and do a show interface tab you see the numberings will be like this GE00 GE01 that is how we have to fill as well so GE03 is VPN20 and let's have the same description IP address in this site is 10 to 21 slash 24 and uh, VPN 10 LAN interface is 2. Let's have the same description. IP will be 10.1 as per my plan. And uh, we are going to have two default routes in the VPN 0 transport VPN. One pointing to 210. 2.1 that's the MPLS next stop and uh, another one will be towards the internet next stop in this site now VPN 0 interface internet interface is GE 0 slash 1 description VPN 0 internet interface IP address is this one 2 slash 24 Let's talk MPLS now. MPLS IP is 2 slash 24 and his interface is 0, 0. Description, let's keep it simple. Host name, we have planned it to be BR1 RT1. Location, let's have it as Chennai system IP 10 1 did we change for branch 2 I think we did yeah so we can go ahead with 103 site ID 1002 uh, hold on a minute let me just quickly validate what we did for branch 2 okay branch 2 is 1002 and we should keep this as 1001 as per our plan Let's go ahead 1001 update I'm just going to download this for safer side it's template 7 let's click next let's click this fail to create a preview fail to fetch configuration for device is the device still on or down Yes, I'm not sure what's the reason. Let's push this. It's a failure. What it is saying? Invalid value for console baud rate. Okay, let's go ahead. Template console baud rate will be there in system. Tell our system edit. Okay, they missed to choose this. Mm, let's keep it to be. Let's keep it to be one one five two double zero. That's the default for VAG if I remember right. Okay, let's try pushing again. Yep, now you see this is the use of downloading the files always. Yes, next. Let's see now. Yes, that's good. Okay, let's push now. Should take it. Let's see. So 
so failure again let's see what the issue now device failed there is a con error path okay i hope uh, i have told you about this uh, in this video earlier um, some of the devices may need vpn 512 uh, template even though we are not using that right so that's the error here uh, we need to create a vpn 512 template just as a dummy so that uh, it doesn't complain if we don't do that right it looks like uh, we we are going to remove vpn 512 altogether from the router which it doesn't allow that's the reason it's complaining what we can do here is let me do this let's take this vpn 10 from our vh cloud copy this copy this 512 copy and uh, let me also copy this LAN interface copy 512 now let me search for vpn 512 and uh, first here let's edit this this is vpn 512 and it's ob it's ob and uh, i don't see anything else needed let's just update and search again for vpn 512 this time this LAN interface of VPN 512. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep that simple. In VH Cloud, I know it's uh, Ethernet 0. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to keep it shut down. And I know the interface already. It's uh, ETH 0. I don't need any description. Leave it to be default. No IP. Nothing else. Just save this. Under devices or this VH template. Edit. Go here to VPN 512. Select this one and add an interface and it will be this now update attach the device again let's see let's see if we are going to get one more error i hope no let's see Let's go to configure. Yep, there is. Let's configure. Okay, there you go. It's a success. Let's get back to the router. Let me restart. Okay, I think uh, I should allow SSH uh, which is getting blocked. Let me do that quickly. I'm actually doing an SSH to the internet interface of the router. That's how I'm accessing it. Since I pushed the template without allowing SSH access, it just uh, thrown me away. I'm going to allow this now. Okay, config pushed. Let's try again. Yep, there you go. Yeah, so 
Oh, interface tab. Yes, there is the WAN interface and then the LAN interface configurations are all there. Let's quickly do the validations. Control connections, we have already checked this. OEMP is there as well. Let's see the BFD sessions now. There you go. We see a lot of BFD sessions. Let's just check this one by one. We have BFD session to 101 DC router 1, DC router 2 and the branch router. I can see that via MPLS the tunnels are not coming up. Let's quickly validate this. Let me try ping. Okay, I'm not able to ping this. Let me check uh, the next stop first. Ping. Okay, I'm not even able to reach my next stop. Let me check my lab topology. Maybe I haven't brought up the, the link. Let me check this and come back. Okay, I just identified the issue. It's a VLAN issue in my uh, lab topology in, inside my lab. So I just sorted that uh, post which I'm able to ping to the next stop. Now let's check the BFD sessions. I hope it should have came up. Yes, they are up now. So this is as expected. So I'm having two tunnels to the router one, one via MPLS and one via internet. Same for router two in DC and also for the branch three. I'm really not sure what is this about. I'm not sure why there is one more entry which shouldn't be there. Maybe this is, uh, you see here, it's on a different port, right? It's an old stale entry which is not cleared. Uh, I'll check what I need to do to clear this stale entry, but that's a stale entry. These are the six entries which we uh, need to focus and which we expect to be there, which are there. So we are good for now. We'll move ahead and check the host machines behind branch router 1 and we'll validate the DC and branch 2 reachability from them. First here I am in the voice phone of uh, branch 1. Okay, it's expecting a DHCP IP but if you remember uh, we haven't created a DHCP template at all for VH devices and we haven't called it in the VH template which we created. Maybe just to save time, I'll just go ahead and assign a manual IP here. Anyway, I have shown you the DHCP setting in two sites already in data center and in the branch too. The IP should be 10 to 20. Let's keep it as 100 or let's keep it as, okay, let it be 100, why not? Zero motion. And the gateway is going to be I must check this as well. Uh, let me check my VLAN assignment. Uh, I hope same issue as I did for that interface. There is a VLAN mismatch uh, in my underlay in my lab underlay let me quickly check that okay here you go it's pinging now it's again a vlan issue in my back end so i just resolve that we are able to ping the gateway from uh, br1 phone let's just try pinging 10120.4 yes that's the data center voice phone let me do this as well To the gateway 1010 that's the MPLS interface if I remember right in uh, DC that's the T-Log extended MPLS and then to the destination also let us ping 10 1 I think 10 3 24 not sure what IP it have took 
let me check the IP address of BR2 phone. BR2 phone, what's the IP he have taken via DSCP? 10322. 10322. Here you go. I'm able to ping the other site as well. The point here is when I try to reach uh, BR2 from BR1, it goes directly. 210.3, that's BR2. So I'm going directly to BR2. Let's get into the user machine here in branch 1 now. Okay, here I am in BR1 user machine. Let's first ping gateway 10.2.10.1. Yes, I'm able to ping the gateway. Let's ping 10.1.10.100. That's the DC and let's also ping 10, 3, 10, 100. That's the BR2 user machine. Let's do a trace to 10, 1, 10, 100 first. Yes, it's going to 10, 2, 10, 1 and then it's going to 2, not 1, 11, 1. That's uh, DC obviously and then let's trace uh, 10 3 100 that's BR2 it should go directly that's the expectation yes it's going directly okay that concludes branch one bring up we are able to successfully establish control connection OMP peering is up and also we validated that uh, IPsec data plane tunnels are up from this router all the way up to data center router 1, router 2 and also as well as a branch 2 router. In this section we are going to discuss about the types of policies in Cisco ST1. Let's start. To start off we do have two separate policies. One is control and one is data. I hope you would have understood by the name. The control policy will affect the control plane whereas the data policy is going to affect the data plane. Now, Within the control policy, we do have centralized and localized policy. Centralized policy is nothing but when you write this policy and implement, it's going to affect the complete overlay, right? Whereas localized policy is uh, just going to affect a particular router to which it is pushed to. Moving on, on the data policy, there is again two segregations, centralized and localized. So when you have a centralized data policy, that's going to be implemented throughout the overlay wherever you have selected it to be and then it's going to be executed in the data plane, right? And the localized data policy is going to be implemented in the specific router where it is called to be. The examples of centralized control policy are, say example, we can create a policy where we can alter the topology of the networks. Say VPN1 is hub and spoke, VPN2 is full mesh, VPN3 is partial mesh. We can achieve everything using a centralized control policy. The examples of centralized data policy will be app hour routing, traffic data or C flow D. So when you take app hour routing, it's nothing but a policy written in a router, right? Which states that when you see a bad link, you move my critical application to the other link. For that, the router needs to look into the actual data. So that's a very good example of centralized data policy. And if you look at localized data policy, the best examples are access list which you bind on an interface or some QoS policy which you are going to create there, right? They all come under this category. And for localized control policy, think of a, a site with a managed router and uh, you have an ISP one and you are tasked to create a BGP peering with the ISP. In that case, on that particular router, you need to create a BGP route map, right? that will come under localized control policy. I hope this would have given you some idea about the policy architecture in Cisco ST1. Let's keep going and explore our lab topology and play around with these policies. Before we start applying any type of policies, let us explore the current traffic flow and design of 10 and 20 service VPN in our lab. By default, all the service VPNs is expected to be in full mesh. Let's see. I have logged into all the routers, DC router 1, DC router 2, the BR router 1, BR1 router 1 and BR2 router 1. Now, let's start off with uh, checking the control connections. 
we have validated this already but uh, anyway we will do it again one more time from dc router one perspective we are able to see the control connections good let's check in dc router two yes good there br1 is a vh so that command will not work let's come back there here in br2 yes it's fine in br1 also it's fine show st1 omp peers yes up second router yes up there and also in br2 yes it's up there as well and in br1 so if you see between vh and ch the important uh, difference is the sd1 keyword mostly the other uh, keywords will be always same let's go ahead now let's check the bft tunnels so st1 bft sessions from dc router one perspective he have a tunnel to one or three two tunnels to one or three he have two tunnels to one or four from router two yes i do have tunnels to the other two routers now in br1 we have tunnels to both dc routers and as well as to the branch 2 now from branch 2's perspective we should have successful tunnels as well yes all the tunnels are good now in the overlay the tunnels are all fine we have two service sites vpn 10 and vpn 20 by default any service vpn will be in full mesh meaning uh, we already checked that when we tried to ping from uh, br1 to br2 the traffic went directly in both vpn 10 and vpn 20 isn't it i'll show you how the routing table will look like show ip route vrf 10 from dc router 1 if you see here um, i'm trying to look for uh, 10 to 10 which is uh, br1 I have to reach to 103 router whereas if I want to reach this subnet that's behind BR2 site that's from the data centers perspective same way if I go to let me show you in BR2 the command will look similar there show you know VR of 10 right if you see first for 10 110 uh, that's the subnet from data center. This is also a subnet from data center. This is again a subnet from data center, isn't it? Yes, that's a subnet from data center. And this subnet 10 to 10, that's a subnet from 103. Who's 103? BR1. So when you want to reach to BR1, which is a 10 to 10 subnet, VPN 10 subnet, you go directly. So that's the current status, okay? Same way if I go to BR1, the output will look a little different in VH router. But anyway, it will show you the same thing. So from BR1 perspective, if you try to find a BR2 route, you see this is the route, 10, 3, 10. The next stop is 10, 1, 1, 1, 0, 4. Okay, the 4 is in the second line if you are able to read. This is the complete next stop 10, 1, 1, 1, 0, 4. So BR1 is pointing back to BR2 for his subnet directly in VPN 10, as well as BR2 is pointing back to BR1 for VPN 10 subnets directly. So, as I told you, and also we have already validated this VPN 10 is in full mesh. If I do same thing for VPN 20. See for uh, from BR2 VPN 20 subnet of BR1 is available directly. So he will reach to BR1 directly. And 
if you remember from our theory classes i told you two types of routes one service route and one more is t log routes so whatever you are seeing now this is service route which is in that specific vrf when i say vrf it's the vpn now the next stop for this subnet is informed to be 10.1.1.103. Now to reach to that uh, router, what are the things we need? This is the system IP, right? We need the WAN interface IP and also the encryption key details, right? So where will we find that? We should find that in show SD WAN OMP T logs and let's give enter so this is for 11104 which is actually i think it's, it's local i'm trying to find for 103 it should be there somewhere let me go yeah you see it's there there it is for uh, second router of data center public internet t lock so we have the T log entry for every tunnel endpoints, right? The T log interface is available. Here it is. 1101101103 MPLS interface of this uh, router. That's one. And if you see inside, we have the encryption parameters and also private port and also the public IP, private IP details, everything. And uh, if in case you see public and private IP both same, that means that router interface is not behind an at. If in case that router interface is behind an at, then you will see the public IP separately and the actual private IP, private IP separately. And uh, here it is. You see 101103 for uh, public internet t log as well. We do have the data. So the service routing table will request to the t log routing table. That's how the packet gets encrypted and sent out the actual interface so that it reaches to the other end and gets decrypted correctly. That's the current status of both VPN 10 and VPN 20. They are in full mesh. We will now configure centralized control policy in our overlay so that VPN 10 will be designed as a hub and spoke and VPN 20 will still remain to be in full mesh. Now our target is to make uh, VPN 10 as hub and spoke and leave VPN 20 to be the full mesh. So even in uh, production scenarios, we will see that mostly data traffic will be hub and spoke uh, because uh, most of the destinations the user is trying to reach will be towards the data center servers. But in case of uh, voice, they may need side-to-side -side direct connectivity, right? So how do we achieve that? We will achieve that by tweaking the control plane. For that, we will be doing a centralized control policy. What happens in the backend? Say uh, we have uh, subnet A in branch 1 VPN 10 and subnet B in branch 2 VPN 10. And uh, say for example, in data center, we have uh, maybe subnet C in data center okay what happens is if you know this uh, Cisco SD1 architecture already every route advertisement happens via vSmart the routes the routers doesn't exchange uh, control plane information directly they all send it to the vSmart and then uh, vSmart will distribute the route to the other sites so in this case as well data center will send about C to vSmart and uh, br1 will send about a and br2 will send about b2 vsmart what we are going to do is we are going to write some policy here such that when uh, vsmart advertises to branch one about the subnet b he will change the next stop to be data center when advertising out same way when he advertises to branch 2, we will make that he will change the next stop of uh, subnet A to be data center again. Whereas uh, when we advertise to data center, we will just advertise them natively without changing anything so that uh, data center will receive both A plus B, both A and B subnets. Also, in addition to this, we will make the data center router one as primary and we will make uh, this one as the 
secondary one so that uh, everyone say example when branch one sends traffic to C he will prefer the primary router and only when that goes down he will choose the secondary router let's see how we achieve that as well here in the vManage let's get into the policy page first let's click on custom policy and then topology I'm going to create a centralized control policy so let's click on add topology I'm gonna use a custom policy now this policy is going to be from data center so whenever you write a centralized policy always think from the vSmart shoe so that you will be able to understand that more clearly so now from data center when I receive from data center what should I do sequence type I'm going to add a T lock route sequence I'm going to match with uh, T lock I actually haven't created a T-Log list yet, so let me create it here. DCRT1 10 1 1 101. We have color of MPLS. Let's save this and then call the one which we just created. So when I receive this T lock, I'm gonna accept that and then I'm gonna set a preference for that. Maybe we'll keep it as 500 for no reason. Right, same way. When I receive from router 2, let me create a TLOC list for that. DCRT2 101102 MPLS EPSEC Public Internet and IPSEC right now let's call dc router 2 action accept the preference for router 2 t locks will be 400 higher the preference it will be preferred okay and then for uh, routes let's add one more sequence and what I'm going to do here is I don't need to do any preference with the route because we already have done preference there right with the T lock so let's click this one so that it gives a option of list new VPN list let me VPN 10 10 let me call both here so VPN 10 20 let me have one like this 10 and 20 and then from both VPN 10 and 20 I will receive all the routes that's it simple I don't do any preference in the routes I'll just prefer in the T log that's what I'm going to do in DC we are not going to do anything else when we receive that uh, route from DC that's all we are going to do and then one more to the data center to DC I think should we need 2 DC no I don't think we need a 2 DC because we just advertise everything towards the DC we will just leave it to be the default we will not uh, tweak that we don't need to tweak that now let's add one for Two branches when we are advertising to the branches let's first select uh, T log will match any basically why do we need 
will match any and then send all t logs to that because in our case uh, vpn 10 we need it to be hub and spoke and vpn 20 should be full mesh so anyway we need to have direct tunnels between br1 and br2 to serve vpn 20 so we should tell branches about every other t log say for example if uh, both vpn 10 and vpn 20 we want it to be hub and spoke then we can only advertise about the data center t logs to the branches they don't need to form tunnels to the other branches also right so let's click uh, route this is where we have to tweak this now here we'll match the data center so whether it is vpn 10 or vpn 20 um, the site id dc site id is 100 if you remember let's save that and call dc we'll advertise all the routes from this site and then from the branches what should i do i should first match maybe let's match maze on sites let's create a list for branches branches will be in thousand one starting from thousand one maybe in up to thousand hundred but in our case i have only thousand one and thousand two if in case things comes up in future this will be enough so i just created one site list with with all the branch site ids and action no, even before in match in vpn not both vpn 10 and 20 we have to create one separately for vpn 10 let's vpn 10 and when you advertise to the branches and a route from any other branch which falls under this list and it is a vpn 10 route what you should do is you should send it but so we should change the t lock as dc router 1 and router 2 we should set both so let's create one commonly for both which is dcr dcrt12 which is going to be 10 1 1 1 not 1 and mpls ip sec add one more that's for the public internet ip sec if i go down add save this and then set that that's it save and also we need one more rule where we match any route from branches and if it is okay if it is vpn 20 i need to create one list vpn 20 what i should do let me call this vpn 20 first what i should do i should not do anything i'll just advertise them because the plan for vpn 20 is it should be full mesh so if i go through this step by step when I am advertising to a branch about the, the data center, right? When I match only data center, that means it's matching both VPN 10 and VPN 20 routes from the data center. I'll just advertise them. Whereas when I'm advertising to a branch about other the branch VPN 10 subnet, I will change the T log to be data center routers. 
whereas if I am advertising to another branch about VPN 20, I'll just advertise them, right? We'll not change any next stops. And in terms of T-Log, we are advertising every other T-Logs, okay? That's it. Yeah. So from the vSmart's perspective, when I am receiving routes from data center, I'll tweak them so that I'll choose and prefer router one over router two. And when I'm advertising routes towards the branches, I'll change the next stop for VPN 20 to be data center. And for VPN 20, we will not change anything. And also in terms of T-Log, we will advertise all the T-Logs to the branches. And for the data center, I think uh, from data center, we will receive all routes. That's what we did, right? We will receive all routes and also we will receive uh, their T-Logs with a preference, right? DC router 1 will be preferred, DC router 2 will be less preferred. So uh, I'm going to only tweak in these directions, whereas uh, when the vSmart receives the routes from branches and advertises the routes to the data center, I'm not going to do anything. So let's keep going. Under centralized policy, we'll add a policy. Next, here, we are going to call the topologies which we have created. It's a custom one. So first from DC, import that and then we'll import two branches, import, next, next. Now we have to apply these policies. So as I told you, you should think from vSmart shoes. So two branches. So this should be applied in outbound direction from the vSmart when sending to the branches. So I'm going to choose branches, add, so two branches out towards the branches from DC, which is when I am receiving inbound, so think from vSmart shoes, when I am receiving the routes from data center, I should tweak this as per this policy. Let's preview this once. Okay, name central centralized policy. Preview. Yeah, sequence one says that from DC, DC router one T log will receive with preference 500, DC router two will keep preference as 400. And in terms of route for VPN 10 and 20, I'll receive anything and everything else will be rejected from the data center and to the branches i will advertise all t lock and in terms of route from data center i will advertise everything whereas from branches for vpn 10 i will set the next stop change the next stop whereas for uh, vpn 20 i'll just advertise everything that's it and these are the lists which we have created which is uh, vpn 10 vpn 20 list those things and this is where the policy is applied site list branches in outbound direction and this policy is getting pushed in the inbound direction okay let's save this i think we are expecting an error here i will tell you why let's activate this you see there is an error what does it say it says that vsmart should be in vmanage mode we have actually onboarded the vSmart, but we haven't created a template for the vSmart, if you remember. If I go to devices, controllers, and for uh, vSmart, if you see, it's in CLI mode. So vManage cannot push policies. So obviously, centralized policies will be pushed to the vSmart so that uh, vSmart will change the routes accordingly and uh, advertise to the branches and data centers, right? So he should be in vManage mode. For that, to make it simple, I'm going to create a CLI template and I'm going to create it for vSmart and I'm going to name it simple as vSmart. You see there is an option, rather than going to the vSmart, copy pasting the config, we can just import the config. Let's just add 
now we have a template but this is a CLA template whatever we have created for the edge routers are all feature based templates feature based uh, device templates and this is CLA based device template let's attach device now it should show us the vSmart attach configure if you see here the template is attached successfully let's go back to the policy and uh, centralized policy activate activate now this policy will be pushed to the vSmart and vSmart will change the routing accordingly and share the details with the branches so that the branches will forward traffic according to the routing table now let's get into the edge routers i have connection to the data center router let's first get into the data center router let me open for the second router as well here out of two okay from dc router one perspective in vpn 10 we expect to see all the branch routes here you see we have vpn 10 route from br1 this is and this is br2 we still have them and the next stop is directly pointing to them from data center perspective let's quickly check in dc router 2 show ip route vrf10 let's first complete vrf10 and we'll come to vrf20 so we see routes to both subnets from br1 and br2 vpn10 subnets we see them and his own local routes are also available obviously let's get into br2 now from the branch perspective what is he seeing let's check that so let's ask him year of 10 yep he is getting a default route which is obviously from the data center it is not tweaked nothing happens there but let's go one by one all these three subnets are data center subnets they are received directly but this subnet you see the difference if you remember in our earlier section we validated this subnet and it was going directly whereas now the next stop is data center router one it's not even data center router two because data center router one will be always preferred over data center router two right so br2 now will reach to the data center for reaching the vpn 10 subnet of br1 right earlier he was going directly let me open br1 router 1 yep. i think i typed the host name wrongly maybe we'll see if we can change that Let's quickly keep going here. VPN 10. What does he see? Yes, he is having default route from data center directly and also the data center routes are available. Whereas when we check for uh, BR2 subnets, you see the next stop is 10, 1, 1, 1, not 1. That means he should go to the data center. Let me go to the BR1 maybe br1 pc and uh, okay if you see earlier this is from the last section it was going directly let's try now you see there is an extra hop now which is 210 one the second hop that's the data center he's going via the data center when i try to reach the data center Yes, I'm able to reach the data center, but obviously I'm going directly to the data center. Also, if you remember, I have some internet destinations in my lab, I think this is the IP. Yes, I'm able to reach them as well. They are in the data center. 
okay they we have an internet link in the data center and i have created a router in uh, my gns3 there i have some uh, loopback ips if i remember i have some six loopbacks so i should be able to ping uh, ips in this range yeah here it is okay anyway so this is going using the default route we don't have a specific route for this whereas these things we have a specific route but the important point is vpn 10 is now hub and spoke that's our requirement right let's see now what's up with vpn 20 let's first check the routing tables and then we'll come back to the host and validate vpn 20 we, we expect to see no change at all so from data center's perspective he knows about the vpn 20 subnets in br1 and br2 same goes for uh, router 2 of the data center as well yes whereas uh, when i go to the br2 remember vrf 10 have changed to be hub and spoke the next stop is changed but we don't expect that to happen for this right yes mm, here you go i have the br1 subnet vpn 20 subnet but i can reach him directly so as per our requirement vpn 10 is hub and spoke vpn 20 is still full mesh let me open up a br2 phone and i think uh, 10 1 10 2 10 100 isn't it what's the uh, no i think it's 20 100 that's the ip address of br1 phone yes so let's trace this trace 10 2 20 10 2 20 100 you see we are going directly we are not traversing via the data center whereas if i ping 10 124 which is the data center i obviously go directly i'm able to ping and let's check uh, trace quickly i go via the data center directly right so vpn 20 is still full mesh vpn 10 is hub and spoke let us now configure branch 2 so that uh, whenever the user traffic from branch 2 reach to any internet based destinations they locally break out via the internet link in the site rather than going all the way up to the data center location for internet breakout if you remember our design there is an internet link available in the data center inet2 and also there is an internet circuit which is uh, inet1 which access transport so from branches perspective they don't need to tunnel all internet traffic all the way up to the data center and then break out of the internet circuit available in data center. They can even break out of the internet link which is available in their own locations. But the only thing which concerns people in production is the security, right? When we break out the internet, we obviously need security in the edges. That will be taken care of using a lot of options. We may have uh, firewalls separate for every branch or we can even implement security features available within the SD WAN, right? So for now, what we are going to do is we'll just quickly go ahead and uh, validate the current internet path for BR2 host machine and then we will enable local breakout and then we'll follow the path again. Let me get into BR2 PC from here. Let me first ping. 100 100 100 100 this is just a loopback which i created to simulate internet so i'm able to ping let me trace now 100 100 100 100 let that complete yes you see the first hop the first hop is 10 3 1 10 3 10 1 that's my local gateway and then it's going to 200.10.1.2 that's the data center and the third hop is 10.1.1.2 that's the data center VPN 10 interface between uh, DC router and uh, core switch I hope. 
and then followed by that he is reaching to the internet router that's my ip which i have configured for the internet router okay so he is taking the longer path which is he is tunneling the traffic all the way to the data center and breaking out let me show you this as well quickly from br2's perspective if i do a show ip route brf10 br2 phone oh my god i mean br2 phone let me do it from here to router show ip out we are 10 yep you see here i do have a default route from omp but the next stop is 10 1 1 1 0 1 which is the data center router right what we are going to do we are going to make this breakout locally to this 100 100 100 destination let's see for this the first step is we have to go ahead to the internet interface right we have both internet and mpls in br2 we are going to break out via the internet interface for that we have to enable nat on that internet interface yes, this is the interface right so if you see this is the template which is getting attached to all the three sites uh, three routers to be exact dc router one dc router two and then also to our uh, br2 router if i enable nat from this template it's going to get applied to the data center as well i don't have a device specific option obviously what i'm going to do here is i'll take a copy and then we will move br2 router to a separate template let's copy this guy like that Copy. Here is the one. Edit and we don't need to change anything. We'll just enable NAT in this template and then we'll go to the uh, template, device template uh, for that uh, location and change this one there. Let's go first here to NAT. Globally enable NAT and when we are enabling that we have a lot of options we can uh, do a overload to the interface ip or we can enable a pool and then ask the router to nat with that pool or we can even create a loopback interface and then ask the router to overlay overload or nat to the loopback interface also we can create static nets so that options are also available these are helpful when you want to open connectivity from internet towards the local host right say if you want to uh, host an application in internet then you might need to do static net okay let's update yes and as i told you we'll change it in the device template now this is it yes and we'll edit go ahead and you see we have normal internet interface template we'll change it to be the interface template which has not enabled if you remember i haven't changed anything apart from that nat options so that it's not going to prompt me to fill any values it's already green if you see right this is mainly because i haven't played around with that keywords of the variables right so it will use the existing values i can show you the config also here config diff and if i go down there should be some new commands which gets inserted yeah you see there is some nat related commands getting inserted which is getting overloaded to gigi2 in our design gigi2 is our internet interface you see and also nat's uh, that outside is there yes those are the changes let's push this so the first step which is enabling NAT on the internet interface where we are going to break out is done so once this is pushed it is done actually yes it's pushed successfully so the part one is done the next part is adding a static route pointing towards vpn 0 so what we are going to do is we are going to get into the vpn 10 and then uh, tell vpn 10 
instead of using that OMP route, which is pointing to the data center, you just send whatever matching the default route to VPN zero, right? That, uh, that means uh, you're locally breaking out. So you have to get into the transport VPN and then we already have NAT there so that it gets NAT using that IP and goes out directly rather than getting tunneled. So to do that, we have to add a static route in VPN 10, right? If you remember, we haven't added any static route in our template. So that's what I'm going to do now. So this is the one, edit. Under IP route, I'm going to add a new IP route. If you see, we do have this uh, optional option so that uh, we can use the same template which we already have pushed to all sites and then uh, enable this route only for the branch i'll show you if in case we don't have that option we should have created a separate template and uh, pushed it only to the branch too now let me name it proper way um, DAA direct internet access one this is not vpn zero this is vpn 10 right and then i'm going to make it as optional row and the next stop is not an actual next stop it's a vpn right we'll take it to the vpn zero and then we'll enable that and add i haven't given the prefix we'll do the prefix it's a device specific one so it's going to ask me for changing in dc router 1 dc router 2 as well but if you see already it's green so since that is an optional row whether we fill that or not it can push the configuration to the edge but uh, we intend to change it for branch 2 right so we'll go only to branch 2 and then get in there search for our daa Oh, where is it? Yeah, here. Even though it's optional, we want that. So let me do 0000 slash 0 update. Next, I'll just check for this. Whereas uh, the other ones are there, but uh, we know that there is no changes in those routers. Let me close this. Okay. Here you go, the config diff. This is the only change. There is a default route added in VRF10 pointing towards global. Global table is the VPN0 of Cisco iOS XE SD WAN router. Okay, let's push this. Once this is pushed, we should see that um, branch 2 is locally breaking out towards these internet destinations. Okay, I can see the config is pushed successfully to all routers. Let's get into BR2. Now let's check the same routing table. We are of 10. If I scroll up, you see earlier it was pointing to 10, 1, 1, 1, not 1. So if I do this now, that default route is changed to point to null zero but don't worry it's not actually null zero if you see there is a new route type which is a star nd if you search for that that should be nat and then yeah nat daa nat direct internet access and the small one refers to that as well okay now let's get back to our pc which is in branch 2 let's see if he's still able to ping the 100 ip yes he is able to ping 100 ip now let's ask him i'm not sure whether trace will work because we are getting natted let's see yes that's good news if you see the second hop which is 2.1 11 3.1 that's the next stop ip of internet interface in branch 2 this means that the traffic is sent in the underlay itself rather than getting tunneled, right? So the traffic goes from the BR2 directly into the internet cloud in the local site. And then further, if you see 1112, 
that's the internet connectivity link from the cloud to the uh, router which i have in my lab right internet server router which i showed you earlier so now we can confirm that daa is successful branch router 2 is locally breaking out to all the traffic which is getting matched by this uh, default router there is lot more options uh, we can even locally break out uh, for specific IPs or also we can create data policies and then match traffic and take it into VPN 0 um, rather than matching based on route we can match based on uh, applications also okay let us start discussing about application of our routing feature in Cisco sd -WAN. By default, Cisco SD1 will collect loss, latency and jitter between every tunnel endpoints in both directions. Meaning, if you notice on the screen, there is two tunnels between Site1 and Site2 via MPLS and Internet Transports. If we look from Site1's perspective, it will continuously probe via both of its tunnel to Site2 and note down loss, latency and the jitter for each of the tunnels separately. Same way, Site2 will also capture data from its perspective in other direction. This process of capturing loss, latency and jitter for every tunnel from every edge router in Cisco sd overlay will happen by default. This is totally irrespective of whether or not you have created an application aware routing policy. We can write application aware policies with a lot of granularity in Cisco sd and set actions based on this SLS captured already by the Cisco sd -WAN. To configure an AAR, which is application aware routing, we will first create a SLA class in vManage, then a application list matching required applications. This can be either based on L7 or L3 or any other parameters as well. Followed by this, we will create an AAR policy where we will match the application and set actions based on the SLAs which we have defined. In addition, we can also enable logging for the same. If you remember from our lab topology in GNS3, I have added net term application which can simulate loss, latency and jitter. We will create application aware policy so that all branch users who are destined to DC server will pass primarily through MPLS and failover via internet transport only when latency goes beyond the provided threshold in MPLS transport. Okay, let's start this. To demonstrate this application aware routing, I'm not going to match actual applications, rather I'm going to simply match it based on IP address. But uh, I will show you this uh, SLA driven failure, right? If you remember, I have showed you that uh, in branch 2 and branch 1, we have uh, added a device which is uh, NetM. So we'll go into that NetM and induce latency in the link and then we'll see whether it fails over to the other link or not. For this, from branch 2 PC, we will make a policy such that it primarily chooses MPLS1 and then when it sees a certain latency in MPLS1, it will fail over to internet. That's what we are going to do now. Before I do this, let me show you what's the current status. There is multiple ways to validate current status. We can get into the router and see there. We can check the flows. But uh, there is an uh, easy option which is we can get into the vManage. There is option to simulate flows in vManage. I'll show you. Just hold on. Here in vManage, let's get into monitor network and uh, branch to router one. Go down to troubleshooting and then simulate flows. I'm going to ask the router. If there is a traffic in VPN 10 sourced from this interface and it is destined to 10, 1, 10.100, what would you do? Right? We can even give application options as well. When you have an application level policy, that will help. For now, we don't uh, have any application level policies. right? So if you see, what does the router say? He is going to load share the traffic between MPLS and public internet circuit, which I have. Simple. Let me go back now, start writing a policy, policy, custom policy, traffic policy and here in application our routing section, 
let's create new and uh, I'll just name it simple to be application of policy right and the first sequence rule I'm going to match based on destination data prefix okay we can create a prefix list and then um, add it here if you remember we created for VPN list site list right same way we can do what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep it simple by adding here this is our destination right this is the server in data center so when traffic is destined to that IP what you should do is you should check the SLA class right that SLA class is I'm going to create my own my SLA and if the latency goes beyond 50 ms I don't want to use that and if you see right there is lots and lots of options when you create an application of a routing policy we will discuss that uh, in our uh, other video series if you want to know in detail about app hour routing you can follow me on that series as well now here we'll keep it simple we'll just add a sla my sla and uh, even though both of the links are within the sla i want you to prefer mpls right when MPLS goes red, meaning he goes beyond the uh, configured SLA, then you choose the other one, right? When SLA is not met in any of the link, what should you do, right? We'll not touch that for now. We'll keep it to be the default. Let's save this. And then default policy, we'll just save this. Go back under the centralized policy let's edit that and uh, under traffic rules here in application our routing will import whatever we have created and even at the start you could have directly came here into this centralized policy and uh, we can create the app our routing policy here also we can choose either way right Let's go back to application and then under application our routing where I'm going to push this. I'm going to push this to say to all branches, let it be in all branches and then I'm going to select for specific VPN. I'm going to push it for VPN 10 only for now. Okay, let's push this. Now this policy gets pushed to the vSmart but anyway application of a routing policy needs to look into the data packet and then take decision based on that right. So VH should have a copy of that. What vSmart does is via OMP update he will share this policy. I'll show you. You see it's success. If I go to this and if I ask this router show STVAN policy what you received from vSmart he will show you that application ever routing policy you see he shows you this now let's go back to the vManage and uh, under network br2 rt1 and uh, troubleshooting simulate flows let's do it again vpn 10 source and destination same let's simulate now you see now he is saying that i am going to use only mpls right here in br2 pc let's trace my path to data center ip which is not sure where it is let's type it you see I am taking 210 one that's the MPLS IP right I'm using MPLS path if I want to show you the current latency 
we can check that by showing a Steven and let's find out uh, the MPLS tunnel from branch 2 to data center router 1 I think this is it remote system is 10.1.1.1.1 which is data center router 1 and local color is MPLS the remote color is also MPLS this is the one and um, this is the latency mean latency is 17 that's why it's using MPLS next let's just do a quick tweaking of the BFD pole interval let me show you this and explain what it is okay if you see here this template we have already created and pushed to the edges and there is two options which is multiplier and pole interval this defines uh, how long the edges takes to calculate the SLA right say for example by default it's uh, six intervals I mean six buckets and uh, six lakhs milliseconds which is almost 10 minutes I think so by default it collects last 60 minutes data and then takes mean average so that based on that mean average will act right when that mean average goes beyond the threshold will act immediately and switch the traffic if needed we can tweak this as well in that lab I'm going to tweak this so that the convergence after the event right I mean when I say event uh, when we increase the latency it will be quick I'm going to keep it 60,000 which is one minute and five multipliers which is five to one total five minutes we should take care when we do this in our production because uh, it depends right even we keep it more aggressive there is chances that uh, things will keep I mean um, there is chances that uh, the things will start flapping let me do this in the VH as well let's wait for this to be pushed if we check the last one which we pushed to all the three routers that was successful and yes this is successful as well we have just changed the value let us give this network a minute so that it will converge properly we'll get back into the router and check the current latency okay now after around uh, two to three minutes I'm checking show SD WAN app route status. If you see, this is the tunnel from uh, BR2 router all the way up to 101101, which is the DC router one, the tunnel via MPLS. The current loss is zero and the latency is around 18 MS, right? Same way, if I do this again and go down, check for the internet tunnel yeah internet path that is also around 17 ms and our path is still via MPLS because that is our preferred color what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get into net m3 that is my latency inducer between the MPLS link Here, let me click delay. Let us add a delay. Maybe let's increase it to 100 ms. If you remember, in our uh, SLA threshold, we configured the it as 50 ms. If the link is beyond 50 ms, you should not use that. That's what our policy says. 
let's wait for this to detect this right mm, yeah you see it's still around 18 if we give it a minute it will change from uh, 18 to whatever it is currently around 100 and also if you see in every interval there is uh, 66 packets on an average which is because uh, I have given the poll interval as uh, 60 seconds one minute right and the BFD is uh, per second that means on an average we'll see about uh, 60 packets uh, in a bucket which is an interval again right, let's give this a minute I'll pause this okay here we go if you see this tunnel statistics the latency is about 216 ms now right this is the tunnel mpls tunnel to the uh, data center router one if i do this again and keep going down let me do that you see for uh, the tunnel via public internet that's still at uh, 18 ms because we have increased the latency using netm only on the MPLS link. If I keep going down, the tunnel to the secondary router via MPLS is also in higher value and uh, in the one via internet to the second router is still good and uh, the one to branch one via MPLS, whatever via MPLS is bad, right? Whatever via in internet is still good. So that is what we expect. Let's go back to the vManage. Now let's query this vManage. Let's see what he says now. Branch to You see, now he says that he is using public internet. Yes, MPLS is up, but he have crossed the given threshold. But if you check for, say, for example, dot one, some other IP other than the one which you have given in the policy, that is still being load shared. If you remember, we have created policy only for that server. So whatever decisions being taken will be taken only for the server. If I do for the server again, the server will be intelligently shifted to the other circuit so this is what you can do for your critical applications over other normal applications let me also do this get into vr2 pc and you remember this trace um, that was through mpls that time let's do it again yeah the second op is 201 11 10 that's obviously our internet in uh, our lab topology. I think we have tested application aware routing, but uh, in my lab, I have restricted it with the IP subnet. The same logic applies even when you match based on applications. As we know, all our evident infra is running 26x code. We will go ahead and upgrade all of them to the next version so that you will also get an idea about how to execute a Cisco sd one head and upgrade. Let's start this process. The first step in upgrade will always start from vManage. Let me show you the current versions. If you see here for WAN edges, they are all on 17.61a and the edges uh, V edges in 26.1, leave those for now. The target for us is controllers. The controllers V smart and V bond are in 26.1. V manage is also in 26.1, right? We'll start with uploading the image which we have into the V manage repository and then we'll follow that up by upgrading the V manage V smart and V bond. I'm going to upload software image, add new software image to the vManage itself. The file will be saved in the vManage. Let's browse to the destination. First, let's upload the vManage 
upgrade file for we manage it is a separate file whereas for the other devices uh, we bond we smart and we adjust hardware we adjust, there is one single file totally there is two files which we need to upload into the we manage now so that we can upgrade our we manage we bond and we smart okay if you see here the we manage upgrade file is successfully uploaded let me do the same for the other file yep okay if you see here for software version 26.3 i have a file which is viptala 26.3 which can be used to upgrade the V edges and uh, V smart and V bond and uh, there is one for V manage himself. If I go back to maintenance software upgrade, now under V manage it will give us an option to upgrade. There is three steps in upgrading a Viptala box. The first one is upgrade which just installs the new image into the box and then activate that is when the device will go for a reload right when you just upgrade which means uh, it just installs it doesn't reload that time only when you activate it reloads so say for example you can just push the image or install the image into a box uh, during a working hour and uh, when you have your window you can go ahead and just activate that image and finally, when the router comes back up, router or uh, the controller comes back up with the new image, you just go ahead and set that to be the default version so that when the box powers off and uh, comes back again, it will come up with the default version only. Let's start here. For the vManage, let me click upgrade. And where the file is, it's in vManage. You see, it's now showing 26.3. Let's click upgrade. As I told you, this is going to just install the image in vManage. It's not going to upgrade it. I'll pause this and uh, get back once this is uh, completed. Okay, if you see here, the process is completed. We have successfully installed the 26.3 version on vManage. We can quickly go back to maintenance software upgrade and to vManage. Here you see the current version is 26.1 but 26.3 is there available as well and also the default version is 26.1. Let's do one thing. Let's go ahead and install the image in vSmart and vBond also. I'm going to push the image to both at the same time. Let's do this. You see also there is option to activate and reboot after installing the image if we want to. But for now, we are not going to do that. We'll just install the image. I'm going to pause this again and uh, we'll connect back once this is pushed. In the meantime, one more thing. If you see, even if I push uh, both at the same time, the second one is saying it's waiting for the V bond to get completed. So it happens that it pushes one at a time. If you notice, the first one is pushed and installed successfully, then the second one started. Let's see how long this takes. Here you go. It is installed in vSmart as well. We'll go ahead and activate the image in vManage. And once vManage is successful, we'll go ahead and set default version there. Followed by that, we'll go ahead and activate in vBond and vSmart as well. Let's keep going. Let's get back to maintenance, software upgrade, we manage, and let's click activate. Which version you want to activate? 26.3. Let's activate it. Now, this is at least going to take around 20 30 minutes, as I seen in my previous cases. So, I'll pause and get back when this is ready. Okay. I can get in via the CLI into vManage. Let's just quickly see show software. You see here 
2063 is active and then still 261 is the default that we have to come back and change let me also see a request yeah, the services haven't started it let's give it a couple more minutes okay if you see here now all the services came up in the vmanage it took some time but eventually it came up if we check the vmanage GUI that's up as well let me get into the vmanage GUI yep everything seems good and let's get into the software upgrade page and under vmanage if you see the current version is 26.3 now and 26.1 moved to the available version but still default version is 26.1 which should not be the case so I'm going to set the default version as 26.3 now okay if you see it's done now we manage is upgraded successfully all three steps are done if I get into we manage you see the current version is 26.3 available version 26.1 default version 26.3 one of the thumb rule is you should make sure that the current version and default version is always same right let's go ahead let's go into controllers you see we have the vsmart and vbond in 26.1 but the available version is 26.3 and default version is 26.1 we are going to activate 26.3 in these boxes let's activate 26.3 now both the boxes will go for a reload and come back up um, if you think you are doing this in production obviously you will not reload both at the same time because this is my lab I am doing this way from here let's go to maintenance software upgrade and under controllers let's select both you see the default version is 26.1 select uh, set default version and change it to be 26.3 for both this is going to take uh, not even a minute let's hold here okay you can see that now the default version for both vbond and vsmart is 26.3 we can quickly go to maintenance software upgrade and check and validate the same under this tab you see it's 26.3 now for both vsmart and vbond and then the vanage upgrade will also go through these three phases where we'll install activate and then set the default version we manage being the critical component in cisco st1 overlay there is multiple options to back up the cisco we manage for recovery in case of a failure let us quickly discuss some of the options in which we can back up the we manage the first option is that we can back up the configuration db from vmanage so that when you restore this in a new vmanage you will be able to restore the configurations but remember this will not uh, restore the statistics database this is only the config database so configuration db and uh, backup let's say i'm pushing it to home I think I have to put isn't it home okay I think the command is path and then home path slash home slash admin slash test backup let's see okay if you see here the backup is completed it says that it successfully backed up the config DB under home admin let's quickly validate that under home admin we are in home admin if you see let me do ls you see this is the backup file you can scp and then uh, take this outside maybe we can use it for restoration if needed the next option is to take a snapshot of the vmanage vm itself this is the most preferred way this will restore the complete vm so that you will get the statistics db as well 
there is also other options in which we can give the v manage the required redundancy by creating a cluster of v manage and also we can do dcdr based active standby v manage i think i do have covered all the major pieces of cisco st1 and we have brought up a cisco st1 overlay together successfully even though this course is going to help you a lot with Cisco ST1, I strongly encourage you to go through our other Cisco ST1 series in our channel where we discuss the nitty gritty of the Cisco ST1 in depth. I have shared the playlist link for that course in the description box. I always recommend people to explore the technologies in lab so that you can understand the concept in great detail. There is a lot of virtual lab options available for Cisco ST1. Let's see if I can post a video showcasing the same to you. But please do reach to me via comment section or email for any queries or support. Take care and bye for now.